Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission, Director of the Department of City Planning. Hope everyone enjoyed their weekend, and I would like to welcome you all to uh, today's review session. Today's date is December 12th. The time is 1.03 p.m. We are joined today by Vice Chairman Knuckles, Commissioners Benjamin, Osorio, Cerullo, Dweck, Germani, Marine, and Rempershad. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and before we uh, get to agen our agenda today, I just want to note uh, there was a pretty big announcement made last week by uh, Mayor Adams uh, where he unveiled the city's Blast Get Stuff Built report. Uh, that plan uh, outlines 111 strategies that will, in fact, help to get stuff built by cutting down on red tape that's unnecessarily slowing down the production of housing and affordable housing and job space. Uh, we estimate that this transformative work alone can translate into a cost savings of about $2 billion and thus the construction of tens of thousands of new homes over the next 10 years. Among other things, Get Stuff Built allows our staff at the Department of City Planning to simplify the pre-certification process. This includes cutting out environmental review that has proved unnecessary for small housing projects, for example, and modernizing our city's traffic analysis to make it simpler and smarter. We'll also allow land use applications to be filed earlier, increasing transparency for communities and speeding up this process overall. These moves will help get proposed projects in front of the commission faster and will make, we hope, will make the land use process more accessible to the public sooner. Uh, the mayor also announced details for our Bronx Metro North plan, uh, which aims to leverage the four new commuter rail stations that are coming to the East Bronx. The plan would help create 10,000 new jobs and as many as 6,000 new homes, at least 1,500 of them income restricted. I invite everyone listening uh, to tune into our remote public info sessions. They are happening uh, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. and Thursday at 1 p.m. to learn about the plan. You can visit nyc.gov forward slash engage for the meeting details. The mayor also officially launched the Atlantic Avenue mixed-use plan. This community-led proposal aims to bring housing, commercial and industrial jobs, infrastructure improvements, and more to Atlantic Avenue and its neighboring blocks in Crown Heights and Bed-Stuy. Uh, the first public meetings uh, at Atlantic Avenue will take place in January. We want to thank Council Members Crystal Hudson and Chi Ose for their continued hard work and engagement on this important initiative. Now, turning to today's review session for certifications, uh, which of course are the projects that are just now entering the city's official public review process, we will go over new housing and job opportunities in Brooklyn and Queens, respectively. In Brooklyn, we will learn about a 100% affordable housing project known as Lincoln Wortman, sponsored by the city's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. It aims to create over 200 homes in East New York. In Queens, we'll hear about a project that would increase light industrial and warehouse space proposed for a manufacturing district and adjacent to the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. In Woodside, the project is expected to generate over 160 jobs. To start, though, uh, I am really happy to share with you that we have a special guest and presentation today. I'm honored to introduce Mike Lenz, who is the Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy and Associate Faculty Director of the Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor Lenz is co-author of an extensive review of research, recent research on the neighborhood level impacts of new development. It is a study of the studies out there. Now, I invited Professor Lenz a number of months ago to share with us a summary of his research, since it is not only hugely important to understand as a matter of public policy, but it is also certainly very relevant to the Commission's work. I have found his research to be instructive to the issues of development and displacement that we are talking about every day. We're incredibly honored to have him with us today. Let me just note, Professor Lenz is a graduate of NYU Wagner School of Public Service. His work dives deeply into the potential of land use, 
zoning and other public policy tools, among them housing production and tenant protections, to address inequities that harm low-income families and communities of color. Most recently, Professor Lenz has published on eviction and the experience of tenants during COVID, and he is finishing a book that examines 50 years of neighborhood change in black neighborhoods following the 1968 Fair Housing Act. So I will note that Professor Lenz is with us by Zoom. Professor, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to, to speak to the commission. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everybody see the PowerPoint that is up there? We certainly can. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, thank you uh, for that, that warm introduction, um, and it's good to uh, virtually be able to, to speak to you today, um, and I, it's, it's wonderful to hear about uh, all, the, all of the commission, or some of the commission's uh, important work that you have ahead of you today um, and beyond. So I wanted to, uh, I was invited to speak uh, about uh, this, this uh, set of new set of uh, studies that are out there that we summarized um, in, a, in a short report on um, through, the, through the UCLA Lewis Center. Um, and it's just important to caveat that none of this, none of the research was mine. I'm kind of riding the coattails of others in summarizing their studies. Um, so it, it's it's really, but it's really important. I think that we we uh, you know kind of understand this new body of research because it speaks to a lot of important issues in in zoning and housing affordability. So you know, I'll start with you know some kind of basics that I think all of us are pretty familiar with, particularly in New York City. Um, so rent has, of course, always been very expensive in New York City, and it, and it probably always will, you probably always will struggle with some affordability problems because it's such an amazing and productive place uh, to live and work. Um, and there are roughly three things that we can do to make housing more affordable. We can subsidize people's rents, we can regulate, regulate rents through uh, rent stabilization and rent control, um, and we can build more housing, whether that's subsidized or not. And I would say that New York is, is more uh, active and productive and successful at doing uh, pretty much all of this, um, you know, including the subsidizing and the regulating. Um, but like everywhere else, New York does not allow enough housing production. And of course, as you all know, given your, your, your positions, uh, zoning is the mechanism toward allowing more housing production or not. Um, New York City housing production is, is not terrible, um, but it is basically uh, flat uh, since the 90s. And so these are the annual number of housing units approved from 1961 to 2019. And in the 2010s, the, the housing approvals are you know, pretty much in every year lower than in the 2000s with the exception of 2015, which you all probably know why that is so strangely an outlier in the 2010s, uh, much more than I do. Um, but you know, essentially, if you're comparing to the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, those were decades in which New York City had you know pretty uh, pretty low population growth and population loss in a lot of years. And so, in times like right now, where New York is absolutely thriving and lots and lots of people want to move there and stay there. Um, to have housing production be kind of is, is minimal, as low as it is, is, is obviously a, a bit concerning. Um, and this is the total number of housing units in New York City, um, you know, in the kind of, you know, in the housing stock um, over the decades. And, you know, again, we see that there's more housing units now than there used to be, but there are many more people who want to live here and may, or there and many people that do live there um, than in the uh, 80s and 90s. And so, um, you know, we have from 2010 to 2018, a point, less than 1% uh, growth in the total number of housing units. Um, you know, that's, that, that's a pretty slow pace um, and, a, and a pace that's probably not going to keep up with, with the um, incredible demand that the city has. So, um, you know, as far, as far as the relationship between housing production and housing affordability, it's pretty simple at the city or regional level, right? Like, 
um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to regional housing markets, we know that housing more housing you know is important to keep um, housing uh, more affordable. But this is certainly more complicated at the neighborhood level, uh, particularly when we talk about lower income neighborhoods where we might be worried that uh, new housing is going to attract higher income residents and high, high and the things that higher income residents demand. In higher income neighborhoods, we might not worry about that too much. And so, um, you know, that's one argument for kind of building more housing in higher income neighborhoods because we're not worried about things like gentrification and displacement. But if in lower income neighborhoods, if, if we found that new housing made existing housing more expensive, we would, uh, you know, we would find that concerning because we're you know, really worried about uh, the affordability problems of lower income tenants first and foremost. And so as far as what we think might happen at the neighborhood level, there's two likely effects, right? We have this supply effect in which um, more housing units is going to absorb some of that demand. And then landlords are going to have less power to raise rents because there's other places that people can live. Um, the, on the other hand, the thing that we might worry about is, is something like an amenity or a demand effect in which new housing first might be attractive on its own. It's, it's shiny and new compared to the new, new buildings around it. And so it may be indicative of kind of a physical improvement to the neighborhood. Um, even more likely than that is that new people um, are that can afford this new housing might demand um, other amenities in the neighborhood like artisanal coffee or fancy cheese or you know new brew pubs or something. Um, and then also higher income people do tend to pay more to live near higher income people, other other higher income people. And so um, that's another potential effect in which, um, once a neighborhood has been kind of discovered by higher income people, then other higher income people might uh, want to move there and then price out the incumbent residents. So the other thing about the, the uh, research at the neighborhood level with housing affordability and, and development is that, um, you know, until recently, there were very, very few studies that, that examined this. And in part, that's because uh, data are, are hard to come by, whether it's um, you know, listing data for rentals and kind of figuring out what the actual prices of, of, of rentals are at the neighborhood level, or whether you're talking about um, kind of in real time uh, housing development uh, data. But this is a fast growing area of study um, in part because we have some new sources of data but it's important to note that it, even with good data, it's hard to isolate the effect of new housing on rents in the surrounding neighborhood because developers build new housing where they think rents are high or going to become higher. So this leads, I think, many of us to assume that new housing raises rents because we look around where the cranes are and we say, hey, this is you know, making housing more affordable or, or, or more expensive. But you know the the challenge is that we're often identify we're often seeing housing production where rents are rising, um, and so it's really really hard to tease out like which came first. Um, and I think these studies that we uh, identified do a better job than than most of the previous research at kind of using new data and new methods to to get at to tease some of this apart. So our report summarized um, five neighborhood level studies. We actually identified six papers. Um, I believe three have since been published um, that really focus on the neighborhood level. So one of these uh, focuses more on the city level and is outside the US. So I'm not gonna talk about that one today. Um, so four out of these five find that market rate housing makes nearby rental housing uh, more affordable and one finds stable or lower rents for nearby homes um, and has some ambiguous effects about kind of the effects on, on lower income uh, rentals. Um, these, so these effects do apply across a, a relatively broad income distribution of rental units. So it affects higher and lower income um, uh, units um, in the ways that we would want to. So it makes it less, less expensive. Um, but the effects are larger for higher priced units, which, you know, would kind of go with logic that could, because we know that, you know, developers build higher priced units in higher priced markets. And, you know, so it, it, it does make sense that those effects would be higher for higher priced units. Um, so these findings, you know, in summary do, you know, 
point to some really important localized benefits from market rate development, but we don't want to, you know, interpret this as, we want our people to interpret this as a, you know, full-throated endorsement of market rate development, regardless of project or neighborhood context. You know, it's important to note that no study is going to tell us exactly what's going to happen as a result of one development in one place. And so I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, about that. So the first paper by Asquith, um, Ast, and Reed uh, from 2019 is called Supply Shock versus Demand Shock. So getting right at this kind of supply versus demand effects question. And they look at large market rate develop, uh, market rate buildings, um, specifically in low income, low income neighborhoods, um, looking at over 1400 buildings with over 50 units um, during the 2010s in 11 cities, uh, including New York City. And they combine this data with listing level data um, on rental prices that include the, you know, the location, the date of the listing, the number of bedrooms and bathrooms. So they have 740,000 units within 800 meters of these new apartment buildings that they're able to look at, okay, what are the listings, listing prices there? Um, you know, speeding ahead to kind of the results, they, they use three different methods and all, that and all find that new buildings decrease nearby rents. Again, these are in low income neighborhoods, so that's kind of important to, 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 to remember. Um, one method estimates a 5% reduction in rents from a nearby new building. So, you know, kind of meaningful effects, not like a panacea of affordability, but meaningful effects. And they also use address histories to identify the origin tract income of those people moving into the new buildings and into nearby pre-existing buildings. And so this is where we're starting to get some evidence about displacement specifically, and they don't find any evidence that um, net migration changes in these neighborhoods um, during, during the period that they're looking. So they're really, you know, they don't, know if these are like perfectly causal estimates, but they it doesn't suggest that there are displacement effects from, from these new buildings. And uh, in the second paper, Evan Mast, who was part of the research team for, for the first paper I just discussed, um, looks specifically at, um, well, the, the title is the effect of new rate, new market rate housing construction on the low income housing market. And he's specifically using um, kind of data on migrations and, and where well, are people's moves basically. And it's it's a little bit technical, um, but uh, you know I think the big picture is that this paper is addressing really a, a key concern, which is that um, developers don't build housing; uh, they they build housing for people of high incomes, right? Um, it's new, it's usually in, in places where people want to live, and that's why the developers build it. Um, and, and so we might not, it, if we think that there are these really kind of strict housing submarkets where housing production at the high end doesn't really free up housing at the lower end, the new housing production would not be beneficial to people with low incomes, and then we really wouldn't be so motivated to kind of allow it, right? Because, you know, if you're our concerns are really with lower income tenants and their affordability problems. Um, so Mass addresses this question by studying what we call migration chains. So when a unit is, is built, he identifies who moves into the unit and where they and the uh, census tract income where they came from. And then he studies, you know, who replace, then he identifies who occupies the housing unit that they left behind and the census tract income that they came from. And so on. And so you have, you kind of can look at as a housing unit frees up in one place, what is the neighborhood income of the place where that person came from? And then what's the neighborhood income uh, where that person came from that replaces the second person and then the third person and the fourth person? And so we're able to kind of see how long does it take for high income housing to affect lower income uh, kind of sub markets? And so he has something over like 52,000 residents of new multifamily buildings in, in large cities. Um, he repeats the kind of migration chain cycle for six rounds. Um, and then and, and ultimately estimates that building 100 new market rate uh, units leads be between, um, uh, sorry, it leads between 
45 to 70 people to move out of below median income census tracts and between 17 to 39 to move out of the lowest income, the bottom quintile uh, census tract. So those are kind of ranges because he's got you know confidence intervals there. Um, but uh, you know generally you're not going to get a one for one uh, effect where you build one uh, high income housing unit and then you have you know a one for one opening at, at the lower income strata. But there are kind of these big, pretty big effects, right? Where you you might see between, you know, roughly, you know, 20 to 40 people moving out of bottom in quintile census tracts. And nearly all of these effects occur within five years. So this concept of filtering where, you know, the housing market, um, op new housing opens up, housing at, at the lower income uh, strata seems to be still functioning to some extent um, as, re as evidenced by these uh, migration chains. And there, it's kind of, so this is a bit of a technical set of figures here, but there's um, some people have done, uh, uh, some folks out of Finland um, kind of replicated this using uh, income data of the individuals. So an important caveat to mass work is you're looking at the income of the neighborhoods that the movers left behind in this uh, data from Finland, they're able to look at the income of the actual movers. Um, and so it actually, so we're actually better able to kind of look at, all right, is this affecting people in older, lower income homes with low, with lower incomes in particular? And they find that by the kind of fifth round of the migration chain, you're looking at, um, you know, 30% of the movers are from the kind of bottom quintile. So the bottom, this is all very kind of technical stuff. And, it, you know, it's even taken my, my, me, you know, a, a while to kind of really wrap my head about what we can conclude here. But the bottom line is that this is showing us that new housing does create vacancies in older homes. And, you know, we can surmise um, vacancies that are attainable for people with lower income. And that's, you know, I think one of the, you know, biggest, uh, most important, you know, most relevant, I think, challenges that people uh, point against new market rate housing. It's like, well, it's only for rich people. Well, the new housing may be for rich people, but it does seem to be creating more slack in the lower uh, end of the housing market, which is really important. Uh, a third paper look specifically at displacement in San Francisco uh, by Kate Pennington. And um, she has a clever way of dealing with selection bias by developers. So she uses randomness in the location of building fires uh, to isolate the effect of, of, of new housing construction on nearby rents, uh, displacement and gentrification. She finds that new construction lowers rents by 2% within 100 meters of the development. So again, kind of an important rent effect. Um, and then specifically on displacement, she finds that um, displacement to a neighborhood with a lower income falls by 17%, and eviction notices specifically decline by 31% in rent-stabilized housing and do not change for non-rent-stabilized homes. This is pretty important, um, you know, particularly in a, you know, obviously New York has uh, very robust rent stabilization protections as well. And so the gap between rents in a rent stabilized unit and a non rent stabilized unit um, grow really fast when you know rents are rising quickly, um, like right now in California, like right now in New York. Um, and that gap gives landlords incentives to push people out of their rent stabilized units. And so if new market rate units are able to slow or halt the neighborhood rent growth, that gap is going to grow at a slower rate. Um, and that's exactly what, what Pennington finds, finds here. Um, <clears throat> she also finds that affordable developments uh, appear to have no effect on local rents or displacement rates. But of course, affordable developments, if we have the money to do it or we commit the money to do it, um, have obvious benefits on their own. Uh, and then she does find evidence of a demand effect. So there is a 16% increase in residential renovations and a 22% increase in business turnover within 100 meters of new market rate developments. 
Um, but you know, the supply effect is stronger than the, the demand effect essentially. But, you know, I know a lot of people, uh, would say that the demand effect is very, very relevant. And of course, you know, business turnover is very relevant. Um, the fourth paper, uh, studies New York in particular, um, a, a fellow graduate of, of NYU, Xiaodi Li, uh, wrote, uh, the, the just recently published the paper, uh, Do New Housing Units in Your Backyard Raise Your Rents? Um, and this is using data in New York uh, to estimate the impact of new high rises on nearby residential rents and residential property sales prices and getting to the demand effect, restaurant openings in New York City. And I think we uh, sent along this, this the full paper um, uh, in, in to the commission. Uh, so the analysis is limited to high-rise buildings of seven stories or, or more. And, you know, one thing here is that this is the costliest building type and most likely to be classified as luxury. Um, I think, you know, that's just, that's not a, you know, specific term, but that's, you know, just kind of what we think of as luxury housing. Um, but, you know, specifically those rents are 60% higher than the average rents in their census tract. So, you know, again, like, New housing is typically expensive and um, even more so for this type of housing. Um, with it, she finds that within 500 feet for every 10% increase in the housing stock, rents decrease by 1%. And for every 10% increase in the condo stock, condo sales prices decrease by um, just under 1%. Um, high rises do attract uh, new restaurants, but again, the supply effect overshadows the amenity effect. And then the last paper um, by Damiano and Frenier uh, called Build Baby Build, question uh, mark, housing markets and the effects of new construction on existing rents. Um, this paper is specifically in Minneapolis and the only paper of the five that finds that new construction increased rents in nearby lower income buildings. They look at rents in existing apartments within 300 meters of new market rate development, find that it lowers rents by 3%. 3% in more expensive building years by, but that it raises rents by over 6.5% in less expensive buildings compared to similar apartments. The other studies don't really look specifically at the submarket of the buildings in particular. We've seen, you know, more when we're looking at submarkets, it's more about neighborhoods. But the Helsinki extension with the figures that I showed you um, to mass paper does this. So the kind of submarket look is one reason why um, uh, the building submarket look may be one reason why we see these different findings. Okay. And, you know, if Damiano and Frenny are all right and everybody else is wrong, then we do have reason to be concerned about the rents of, of lower income people because they're looking at buildings in particular. On the other hand, you know, the other explanation is that their rent data might not be representative. So this concern we've identified from the fact that after you adjust for inflation, the rents in the lower income buildings actually fell from 2000 to 2016, which is not what was happening in the Minneapolis rental market more broadly. So there are kind of some questions about like how representative or, or good the data are. Um, so that's the empirical evidence summarizing our paper. I want to add just a little bit more uh, context before we get to a conversation. So, um, you know, I think important is to look at the history of, of zoning, history of kind of where we do and do not allow development and why. And, it, and first and foremost, we can say that restrictive residential zoning has races and classes origins. And this goes all the way back to 1916 uh, in New York City with its groundbreaking uh, zoning code. Um, explicitly racial zoning first proliferated in Southern US cities when blacks lived in those cities in considerably larger numbers than in the North um, after we made you know, racial zoning, after the Supreme Court uh, ruled that racial zoning was not allowed in Buchanan versus Worley, um, we still had, we had this huge proliferation in you know, uh, kind of race neutral zoning policies that, um, you know, I think the form and function of, I think only the naive among us would assume that there was no demand for racial zoning that uh, followed after it was, you know, so popular in the South and had started to gain foothold in the North. 
And then, you know, so we had a history of racial covenants, of course, um, but those were, those had a collective action problem. And one of the ways that we solved our collection act of action problem in maintaining racially segregated environments in cities throughout the country uh, was uh, through zoning. And so low density zoning, uh, by contrast to a lot of the other kind of more, the other racially disparate uh, policies that we have in housing and land use um, is, is kind of the main thing that endures, I, I argue. So racial covenants were deemed unconstitutional in 1948, the 1968 Fair Housing Act uh, made methods uh, such as discrimination by lenders, brokers, and sellers face more scrutiny. Uh, redlining was then explicitly forbidden um, from then on. Um, urban renewal and some of the segrega segregating housing construction uh, work that we did in the mid middle of the 20th century fell out of favor in, the, in by the 1970s. We stopped building racially segregated public housing and racially segregated neighborhoods, for better or worse, in those years. But low density zoning now, you know, is the one that uh, still endures as a kind of zoning and land use um, practice that has racially disparate outcomes. Um, what are these outcomes? Uh, are they still just historical? Or are they also contemporary? I, I, I argue the latter, that, that these outcomes uh, are, are still contemporary and still happening. Um, so we have an American bias against multifamily housing and dense multifamily housing that I argue is deeply intertwined uh, with bias against the poor and people of color. Um, so first, there are these racial origins, but second, poor and people of uh, lower income households and people of color are much more likely to be only able to afford multifamily housing in particular neighborhoods and cities. And uh, cities, cities tend to zone white neighborhoods as you know, single family or lower density and allow more density in integrated and racially segregated neighborhoods. Um, and you know, this is, I think, very relevant in New York. Um, uh, my colleagues at the Furman Center, uh, Bean, Madar, and McDonald, in 2014, studied the rezonings uh, by, the, by the commission uh, from 2002 to 2009 and found that the share white was one of the strongest predictors of downzoning and one of the stronger, strongest predictors of not upzoning a neighborhood. Um, and then there's you know, lots of research more broadly that uh, connects uh, tighter land use restrictions to segregation by race and income in uh, contemporary uh, US cities and cities around the world. Um, so just to conclude, um, there's growing evidence that market rate housing production keeps rents lower in nearby existing housing, but no studies will ever tell us what will happen from every development in every neighborhood. But suppose these studies are wrong and new housing raises rents by making the neighborhood nicer. Is no nice things really a good affordability strategy? I think is a question that we could debate forever, um, but is, is worth uh, mulling over. And then I think the what we do with this is we first upzone higher income neighborhoods, right? Housing production should still be prioritized in those higher resource communities where we're not really worried about the risk of displacement. We're not really worried about you know potential amenity or demand effects that increase you know rent and and, and housing um, and decrease housing affordability in those neighborhoods as much as we might be uh, worried about that in lower income neighborhoods. Um, and then. You know, policies such as tenant protections and subsidies are essential and complementary to um, allowing more housing in more places, particularly in higher income neighborhoods. Um, so I will conclude with that by uh, thanking you all uh, for your attention and for uh, the conversation that we'll have uh, to follow. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we, we really appreciate your being here with us. And uh, I know that I have a number of questions, and I'm sure that my colleagues do too, but I'm going to kick it off with just a couple of detailed uh, follow-ups from some of the things that you said in your presentation. Um, uh, you, you noted in the middle and also again at the end that um, there are local benefits of market rate development here, uh, but it shouldn't be interpreted as an endorsement of market rate development regardless of the project or the neighborhood. So I guess the question that I have for you and this is sort of to help instruct us 
is how do we evaluate that question of whether or not the addition of market rate development in a particular neighborhood is likely to lower rents for the people who live in the in the general area? Um, that, I mean, that's a very tough one. I, you know, I, I think that um, neighborhood neighborhood context is is important, but you know, the question I guess is what neighborhood context and how do you weigh these diff the, these different characteristics? You know, I think again the the hardest thing to do politically, but the easiest thing to do according to the um, problems in front of you is to um, direct housing investment to places where displacement is not as much of a concern. So higher income neighborhoods, places with a higher share of homeowners, right? Where um, increases in um, increases in rents isn't going to be a problem. Increases in housing values is something that everybody would welcome if you're a homeowner. Um, so I think that to the extent that communities own their own property, um, that is some that makes it that's an important neighborhood context. Um, and then I think one, you know, the, but the hardest thing is making those judgment calls about neighborhoods where we, where you have a pretty good sense that gentrification and displacement is already on the what already on the rise, right? And then I think sometimes that's where we see it most common, where we see these these problems become potentially exacerbated if you have, um, you know, kind of rapid neighborhood change that also is accompanying with you know, new development. But then the problem, if, there, if you already have gentrification displacement occurring in a neighborhood is if you don't build new housing, then people are still gonna wanna move there. And where are they gonna move? They're gonna move to places that already exist and you know people are already renting out and that's going to price out the people that are there um, potentially even faster okay uh one more for me and then i'm going to go to my colleagues you know we sometimes hear people wonder if there's something different about new york city um for any number of reasons uh you know one being it's just the most awesome of cities uh, other is uh you know, more attractive for high income residents longer than other cities or perhaps other things that make New York City exceptional. Question for you is, uh, does the research include evidence here that supply and demand work the same way in New York City as it relates to this research than it does elsewhere? I mean, I think first, you know, um, New York is 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 part of the the sample um, in multiple studies that uh, that I just discussed. So, and then you know, with Shaudi Lee's paper, it's specific. You know, I think one thing, one reason to, I think for for the commission to pay attention more attention to that paper, perhaps, is it you know it's all in New York City and it grapples with you know kind of you know, more New York City specific issues that other cities in the country don't deal with as much. And that's, you know, kind of high rise development. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people outside of New York like to um, like to fear monger about skyscrapers, but that's not the uh, <laughs> that, that's not the, the norm in, in Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, so I think that that's a reason to 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 at least trust some of the data um, that we just discussed in the New York context. Um, but it, there are, you know, I think there are some, there are some differences, of course, uh, you know, single family, single family housing is much less ubiquitous in, in New York than pretty much anywhere else in the country. And so going, you you deal less with questions of going from single family to you know two three four unit ish uh, uh, development than from two three in your context it's more existing multifamily to potentially higher uh, density multifamily um, so potentially different issues there. Um, 
and then but but then you know but you know otherwise you know i think um you know the new york context is not is different as, as far as the neighborhood dimensions and the develop and the relationships between development and surrounding neighborhoods as um as i think people are usually concerned with you know typically these these uh relationships are are similar there than everywhere else thank you professor i i want to know we've been joined by commissioner crowell by zoom uh, and I'm going to go to my colleagues for a question. I've got uh, Vice Chair Knuckles uh, to be followed by Commissioner Kermani and Commissioner Dweck. And maybe Commissioner Dweck, if he is so inspired, and then Commissioner Osorio. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Lenz. I just wanted to uh, drill down on, on a couple of items that you mentioned. Uh, first of all, the housing boom uh, that was apparent from 61 until 69, where you had well over 300,000 units of housing built. Was that attributable to the uh, rezoning of 1961, uh, you think? Or if not, what, what would you attribute that, that boom to? I, I would have to defer to local experts on that. Um, I was I wasn't around in the '60s, and I don't study New York New York's uh, context in, in the '60s. But you know, I mean, around the country, we were building a lot more housing in the '50s and '60s, um, generally. Uh, although New York's housing boom is is older than most. Okay, uh, the supply shock study that that, that you mentioned uh, that included New York, and there was a a data point where you said for every 100 uh, units of, I believe, market rate housing, 45 to 70 people move move out. I mean, were those people uh, displaced, or did they uh, uh, did they move? Where did they move? I mean, were they displaced, or did they just decide to move out, or or what? specifically was the situation there so the way to the way i i can interpret um that finding or or kind of maybe restate that finding a little bit is you build a hundred new units of housing that free that that contributes to moves from lower income census tracts to higher income census tracts as a result of that new housing and that and those moves are at kind of are are amongst lower middle to lower census tract neighborhoods so what is causing those what the way to interpret those moves is those are kind of moves of opportunity that are opportunities that are opened up by the new housing that was built. Um, you know, we can't <coughs> surmise the cir circumstances of each and each and every one of those moves. Um, but I we should interpret those moves positively, if that makes sense. So there is a kind of upward mobility uh, triggered by at least that particular analysis point. Right. Uh, do, we know, do we know when, when lower income people move, um, should we say, uh, upward in terms of, of, of the housing price points, um, do those point? Do those uh, units that are vacated? Um, do those rents remain the same, or do they, um, um, or or do they rise, or do they lower in order to, you know, accommodate the the upward mobility of, of lesser income people? Do you follow me? Right. 
Yeah, no, I, those are, that's, those are great questions. I think we know less about, we're going to know, we're not going to really know the rent that the people are, are going to, are going to, going to pay then. Um, so I think we can, we can surmise a couple different pathways. One, you know, the, the rosiest story from, from that paper is that, um, you build a hundred new housing units and the, you know, the, then people move, people move into those housing units from somewhere else. Someone else moves into their housing and then someone else moves into the someone else's housing. And along each step, the existence of the new housing either keeps the rents the same in a, down the chain or it actually makes rents lower because you have this this new availability right like if you know somebody had if you had 100 cookies you would sell your cookies for less than if you had one cookie remaining you know so that's the rosiest picture a a less a less optimistic take might be that more people moved in from outside of the region, maybe because there's more housing available. Um, they moved from a neighboring city. And then, and so like demand actually was pretty high, was even higher, right? And 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 so like, yeah, then you know the landlord landlords along that chain might be uh keeping prices high or higher right um yeah i mean there's a at least, there's a couple that, yeah you you're definitely pointing to things we don't know for sure and there's and there's ways that it could be it could go in a couple of different ways thank you thank you commissioner commissioner kamani Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, um, Professor, for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so I have a ton of questions, but I will re restrain myself. Um, so commenting, you know, following my fellow commissioners on on a couple of the conclusions that came from these papers. One, and I'll, I'm um, being a little obtuse here, but do new housing units in your backyard raise your rents? No. Um, and, but I want to talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned fear mongering. I want to talk about that and like narrative and political and political will and power a little bit. Um, so this may, this is an obvious question in some ways. So if the conclusion, one of the conclusions is that development does not increase rent, um, and that is n at least from my many, many years, is not a narrative that gets out there in New York City. Um, and there's a decidedly different narrative, and there are movements built around the opposite of that. And so who, in, just in your opinion, kind of who, who gets to tell what narrative, and there's competing fear-mongering, and it's where is the truth and how do you navigate political will and power? And I think this is true also of, you know, up zone, higher um, income neighborhood. I'm really trying not to reveal my politics here, but um, yes, up zone, <laughs> high neighborhoods. But um, again, what does it take to do that? Like what's the political will get stuck? And yeah, so how yeah. does the like data from these data get out there in a way that challenge that becomes a, a narrative lessens fear mongering and pushes political will to do the right thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think you're starting to see you're, you're def, we, we can definitely point to, to some success, you know, on the West Coast, at least, you know, where I'm most familiar um, with getting to that point, I think, you know, there are a few, 
pro kind of housing supply organizations, you know, the yes in my backyard type groups, EMB groups um, that have had a, a lot of recent success um, at the California state legislature, uh, in city governments uh, around the state of California. Um, so I think what you're starting to see and these groups undoubtedly exist in New York as well. You're you're starting to see, for the first time, um, in a very long time, groups of people who are explicitly advocating for more housing. Um, you know, and and these well, more market rate housing, more housing of all kinds. And I think that is starting to change the equation uh, in terms of the politics of this, and it's starting to change the messaging. Um, but it's not really going to be fully successful unless those groups are really, really good at aligning with the tr the traditional, um, you know, incredibly longstanding and hardworking groups of tenants, advocates, and low-income housing uh, supporting folks that have been doing this work for, you know, decades and decades. Um, that has, that's been slow to come in part because, you know, I think amongst incredibly well-meaning uh, people that I just discussed, like, there is a deep suspicion of market solutions to housing problems that make a ton of sense because housing markets have, you know, not benefited these groups in the past, um, in part because of, you know, the, the work of, because of lots of discriminatory forces that are public and private. Um, if, you know, obviously, if we go back to redlining and racial covenants and everything since. Um, so I think the narrative and the politics are changing, but like success is going to be limited unless there's a lot of important coalition work between um, kind of the more fully subsidized or, you know, tenants rights advocate level groups and these kind of market rate advocates. Thank you. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And also, let's let's um, <clears throat> not pretend too that um, while illegal, racial segregation still happens for like, sure all the all, all the time, everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Before I uh, ask Commissioner Dweck whether he is in for a question, let me just note on the subject of tenants' rights. Uh, it, it seems to me to be a direct correlation, but I really would like to get your uh, assessment of this. When talking about the ability for tenants' rights to be exercised, whether it is to protect against a, poten a, a potential abusive landlord or just the sheer price of a rent renewal or the ability to get an apartment um, uh, that is breaking down repaired by a landlord, uh, is that connected by the lack of supply of housing in your experience? Yeah, I would say that's absolutely the case. Um, when landlords know that there are very few other options for people to go to to rent, um, they can uh, do any, you know, they're less likely to repair uh, the housing and upkeep the, keep up the housing that, that they're renting out and they're less likely uh, they're more likely to um, engage in, you know, illegal or pseudo illegal practices that are um, going to push out tenants or violate their rights in, in various ways. Thank you, Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. So in, in 2017, uh, the city passed the uh, mandatory inclusionary housing, which requires for the majority of rezoning, a certain uh, portion of affordable units coupled with the market rate units. And I think that due to COVID, uh, there's been a delayed production of these units uh, um, because uh, we've, you know, we lost a couple of years uh, in, in the process. And so I don't know if you have an opinion or can you opine on, on, 
on what that would do to the studies that you presented to us today and how that you, how you see it affecting it going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think inclusionary house inclusionary housing is a is a tool that you know very it's mandatory in New York. So I think in in, in in what what I was trying to say is in New York it's mandatory. It's not a voluntary program. So therefore, it, it is required. So hmm. yeah. So I think that I don't know exactly how that affected the results in, say, uh, Lee's paper on New York. Um, I guess some of that data, some of that would have been in effect post 2017, and some of it I think it was pre 2017. Um, yeah, I, I think that you know inclusionary zoning is going to be most useful when there's a lot of production, right? You get a bigger number of units when there's more units being built. You get a bigger number of units um, below market rate. Um, so, you know, and then again, like you have the benefit of a below market rate unit, um, as long as you have the money, well, you, 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 as long as you didn't, in your case, if you have mandatory inclusionary housing, the only kind of concern is that, are you getting less development because some developers choose not to build where they have this requirement? Thank you. Commissioner Sorio, Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you so much, Chair, and thanks so much for, for inviting this presentation. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Professor, Professor, thank you so much for your research, for sharing that with us. Um, I had a couple of questions, mostly inspired by the Lee study, um, but I, I really found uh, fascinating, Kanika, your recollection and, and the cross-referencing across the different papers. So I'm wondering if, if there's anything that you can share with us in terms of the impact of the rezoning or the announcement of a study preceding a rezoning, given the potential speculation that that the rezoning can generate in a community, right? I think Lee specifically focuses on the building permits, but as as uh, the author points out, and I think Freemark also points out in that, or, or at least his reference there, that only happens five, six years after the rezoning, where mm -hmm. arguably the levels of speculation could have already triggered the displacement. So I don't know if, if there's anything you can share with us in that regard. That's that's something that is, is really irrelevant for us here in New York. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a tough one. I don't have, you know, I can't, I, I can't really point to a study in my mind right now that, you know, kind of uses that sort of timing, right? Because so you're, I think what you bring up is important because, you know, there, it's not just, there's not just one event, right? When you're talking about either development or a series of zoning decisions that lead to a development, right? There's um, the zoning and land use decisions and the changes. There's when you announce it, there's when people find out about it. There's, um, you know, when land is bought and, you know, uh, when and all these things that lead up to kind of a certi certificate of occupancy and people moving in. And, and, and so I think, you know, an unhelpful, potentially unhelpful thing is is to is to remember that you know cities are are messy and complicated, and, and sometimes things like this are are indicative of that. But um, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes, I, I think I would say I'm most comfortable saying that in spite of like how exciting some of this new research is we don't have and we don't have much in the way of studying zoning changes at a neighborhood in in the neighborhood level context right um and you referenced freemark's paper just now that's one, but it doesn't really speak to rental housing. Um, and an interesting thing about Freemark's paper is they is he studies a rezoning, a set of upzonings that actually don't result in a lot of housing production. So a lot of times there's like all these upzonings and no housing housing production change. And so you want 
the, the land goes up, but they don't give you the housing that would give you the supply effect. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a follow up question? Go ahead. Uh, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate that. And, and almost sort of like building on that response, I was wondering if, because um, I, I also really appreciate one of your bullets about sort of uh, really thinking comprehensively about this and, and really sort of like uh, really making sure that there are provisions in place to secure everything that we've already learned helps prevent displacement and so forth. And, and I, I'm just wondering if, if on that end, there's any research that you can suggest or you can highlight for us that explores the importance of collective home ownership or mm. anything that at the neighborhood level, to your point, may help us understand how to build on existing other existing tools that we have in New York, like, for example, the Housing Development Fund Corporation, the HDFC cooperatives, or other forms of uh, collective ownership, uh, not to mention community land trusts, which are also sort of uh, something that we've seen uh, emerging in New York with a lot of excitement. And I don't know if there's anything that you can help us um, a, or you can point to that could help inform that question. Yeah, you know, there's not a lot of empirical research on uh, shared equity, um, community land trust uh, activity and, and how that affects displacement because we don't have enough of the activity, you know, in those in those areas. And, and I think you, know, you absolutely point to a, a very clear shortcoming in, in just kind of the American uh, dichotomy of, of rental and home ownership that, you know, to the extent that we can, you know, I think there's, there's, I detect like meaningful new energy going in that direction when, you know, could, because we have so, so such drastic housing affordability problems in so many places that people are, I think, increasingly looking to shared equity and you know rental ways that renters can build equity um ways that we can have community ownership of of land um kind of defray the in incredible costs of like first time home buying things like that um so i would say that i'm encouraged by how much kind of talk you hear about trying to give people more options like that. We're not really at the point where people have those options in enough places, I think is, is the bigger problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you, Chair. Professor, I, I just wanna begin first by uh, sharing the appreciation expressed by my colleagues for your presentation and the data that you shared with us today. Um, it's been really helpful. My, in, in listening to the questions and the discussion, uh, my just maybe taking this to a place that's not necessarily specifically relevant to the, to the studies that you presented, but just wondering, it's sort of like looking behind the scenes. Um, and I wondered if there's any information about the jurisdictions that have been looked at and where the data is coming from that establishes what, two, two things, what their sort of land use regulatory scheme is with, with respect to the how approvals are made. I guess somebody asked the ULERP, sort of ULERP came up in a question R, um, but, but whether or not there's an understanding of the type of process a developer would need to go through to get an approval to build housing and what role the local government or the government, depending on what, what jurisdiction the, the neighborhood is in and, and would govern um, that neighborhood, what role they play in the approval process, financing, and and those things because it it seems from the data although that building more housing obviously solves a housing problem but also there's room to be helpful to those who need housing and that some of the arguments that we hear are very often um may be true in some areas but maybe not 
blanketly true across the board. So the idea of expediting development and building housing becomes important here in New York. And the chair opened the meeting by talking about some significant changes the mayor has announced to make, which would, we hope, facilitate, you know, by, by shortening the process, by, by creating a more streamlined process, we may see more housing faster. Is there anything in any of these studies that gives us any answers to those types of questions? Or are there other studies that we could look at that do answer those types of questions? And to, is the question about kind of what, what local processes um, facilitate faster permitting or housing production well, or? Um, yes and no. So just what local processes are implemented or are required for a developer to get approval to build housing, whether or not there's ways to shorten that or expedite it or um, incentivize it, separate piece. But we have a complicated, <laughs> clunky, long-winded process that also impacts commitments those who can develop want to enter and want to get into that process. It's, so I just wondered if there's in some of these areas, and I know the data was about units that have been, it's, it's looking at units that have come into right. a neighborhood, right. but how those units got to be built is sort of what I was looking at, which is why I, I started by saying it's a little off. It's not directly related, but it, right. it, it gets to the point where the study could be done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this the, the studies I, I talked about, you know, don't don't really get into the stuff under the hood kind of before the yeah. housing is 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 built in in in, in real life. Yeah. That is uh and that's important and that and that uh, you know, I think uh, Commissioner Rosario kind of uh, hinted at, it got to this a little bit as well. Um, you know, there are some, there are some things that, I, that we're working on in California about um, kind of both looking at, you know, what, land is zoned for and also the processes um behind um zoning about you know the processes that uh lead to permitting or, or not permitting in of multifamily housing in different cities across the state um you know typically the process is uh less important than kind of the the land use maps and you know what can and cannot be built in in most places in terms of driving housing overall housing production um i can try to share some of those i can share some of those studies that that i think are, are more relevant to the questions you're getting at which is about um zoning and approvals but you know, again, I think we're we're pretty short on research right now. That's like that talks about zoning all the way through to affordability, um, and and these studies are no exception in kind of being limited in that way. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, I want to be sensitive to your time and also uh, to the commissioners here. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask one final question of you, Professor. We thank you very much uh, for your thoughtful review of the academic studies out there. Um, just to close, what would you, what do you say to people who might acknowledge the validity of the research that you presented today, specifically that market rate housing uh, can make rental housing more affordable in the area, but still oppose the neighborhood change that new development can bring? Yeah. Um, you know, I guess to me, cities are the, the best of cities are that they're dynamic and that, that they, that they change and they evolve. Um, 
in cities, I think some of the, the best things about cities are that they're spontaneous and unpredictable. Um, and, you know, that's why that's why you walk through Manhattan for or Brooklyn or um, or Queens or Bronx or Staten Island for, you know, for block upon block and you see something different uh, every, you know, every quarter mile that you go. Um, and it's more interesting there than walking through um, where most of America lives, which is, you know, in some suburban area where the, the houses look the same, the lawns look the same, and the trees look the same, right? Like that sort of variation in New York, you get over space, but we also get that variation over time because there's a dynamism to cities. And so cities change, and I think they should be allowed to change. There's a very big but, there's a very big but um, to that kind of, you know, love of the, the evolving city, which is that, you know, we have, I think, issues in our country. We, you know, issues of race and, and, uh, and class, um, I think, make us understandably cautious about rapid change in uh, neighborhoods that have, you know, a particular, particular racial or ethnic concentration. Um, and we want to protect some of the traditions of those neighborhoods um, and some of the, the things about those neighborhoods that give, um, you know, immigrants or, or Black people or um, other minorities, like a sense of place and a sense of belonging uh, in a country that doesn't always give them that, that sense of belonging. Um, so, you know, that's, that of course, that answer is a on the one hand, on the other hand, and it doesn't uh, tell you exactly what to do, but I think those are the kind of competing notions in my mind that, um, that do kind of make every neighborhood different, um, and, and, and make it to where you have to kind of weigh, um, some things differently in different places. Well, thank you. I think we'll, we'll leave it there, Professor. We uh, thank you very much. And based on your description of walking around all five boroughs of New York City, it's obvious that you miss us. We'd love to have you come visit. Um, we really appreciate your uh, sharing uh, your work and the work of others uh, uh, in some reform today. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. We, uh, we may at some point have some follow-ups for you, um, but we, we really are, are uh, grateful for your time and your energies uh, so, uh, Professor Michael Lenz, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Appreciate it. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the rest of our agenda today. Uh, Ryan, we've got some certifications, uh, and I'm going to let you introduce uh, the first item. Certainly. I just want to note that we have a quorum present in the hearing room at 120 Broadway. Um, the first item on our agenda is a certification for zoning map and zoning tax amendment acquisition and disposition of city-owned property in Brooklyn Community District 5. Lynn Sue Robinson will be presenting for the first time to the commission on this item. Hooray, welcome. Thank you. Good okay. to have you. I'm sorry. Oh, Excuse sorry. I'm recused. Commissioner Rampershad is excused for this item. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, Ed Chair Agrodnik and Commissioners. I will be uh, presenting Lincoln Wartman rezoning. This is an application by the NYC Department of Housing Preservation and Development and JNB Realty LLC for a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, an acquisition, and a disposition to facilitate a residential development in East New York, Brooklyn, Community District 5. The development will comprise of two buildings with a to total of 206 income restricted dwelling units. The project area is in the southeastern portion of East New York Community District 5. The block where the project area is located is bounded by Lincoln Avenue to the east of the site, Wartman Avenue to the south, Autumn Avenue to the west, and Stanley Avenue to the north. Please excuse the graphics as Autumn Avenue and Lincoln Avenue should have been moved over to the right by a block. Directly to the, rest, uh, uh, directly to the west of the project area is Public School 224, a three-story school building with the playground shown in blue. 
Directly to the east of the project area are one and two family homes on Lincoln Avenue. Directly to the south of the project area is a two-story USPS mail sorting distribution facility shown in orange. Two blocks to the east is a large department, a large uh, Department of Sanitation parking lot shown in green that serves the sanitation facility further to the east. One block to the south is a one-story Metropolitan Transit Authority bus depot, shown in red at the bottom of the image. Other notable, notable developments in the surrounding area are the NYCHA pink houses directly to the north of the project area, consisting of 22 eight-story buildings totaling 1,500 dwelling units, shown in purple. Spring Creek Gardens is a four- to five-story income-restricted housing development with retail uses and 260 dwelling units located northeast of the project area in the right uh, corner of the image. Lincoln, uh, Linden Boulevard is a major commercial corridor located two blocks north of the project area. The project area is outside of the transit zone, and the nearest subway station is the Grant Avenue A station and the Euclid Avenue AC station, both approximately one mile away to the northwest. The project area is served by three bus lines shown by the blue circles. The B14 and B20 bus run along Stanley Avenue with stops at the adjacent postal facility. The B13 runs, runs along Crenshaw Avenue two blocks to the west. The project area and the surrounding area is mapped with the R4 zoning district, which permits a maximum residential FAR of 0.75 plus an attic allowance of up to 20% for inclusion of space under a pitch roof, and a maximum FAR of 2.0 for community facility uses. The maximum base height is 25 feet and maximum building height is 35 feet. One accessory parking space is required for each dwelling unit, except that parking is only required for 50% of income restricted housing units. Other zoning districts in the surrounding area include R6 district located five blocks to the northeast from the project area with the C12 district two blocks north of the project area on Linden Boulevard and three blocks east on Stanley Avenue. A portion of the project area is located within the Federal Emergency Management Agency's 2015 Preliminary Flood Insurance Rate Map, 0.2% annual chance floodplain, as well as, a, as the 2020.2% uh, annual cha uh, chance projection, which in New York City is a medium risk flood zone and means the project area is expected to experience flooding risks in the near future. The project area is located on block 4531 and is an L-shaped assemblage of 10 vacant tax lots with a total of approximately 50,000 square feet in lot area with frontages along Wartman Avenue, 70 feet wide, Autumn Avenue, 60 feet wide, Lincoln Avenue, 60 feet wide, and Stanley Avenue, which is also 70 feet wide. Wartman Avenue is a mapped city street. However, the portion of the street between Lincoln and Autumn Avenues on the south side of the project area is unbuilt and is closed to the public. This portion of Wartman Avenue is currently occupied by a local garden group under a temporary agreement with DOT that expires at the end of 2022. The portion of Lincoln Avenue between Stanley Avenue and Wartman Avenue is a mapped and built street that lacks sidewalks on the western side of the street. As mentioned earlier, to the, rest, to the west of the project area is Public School 224. To the east of the project area are one and two family homes and to the south of the project area is a USPS facility. Next, I'll walk you through some existing condition photos. Photo one is looking north along Autumn Avenue with the project area boundary shown in yellow. On the left is Public School 224. Photo two is looking northeast of the project area from the intersection of Autumn Avenue and Wartman Avenue. Photo three is looking northwest at the project area from the intersection of Wartman Avenue and Lincoln Avenue. Photo four is a view of Wartman Avenue facing east from Autumn Avenue with the project area to the left. You can see how the street is not built out and is occupied by a garden group. Photo five is a view of Lincoln Avenue facing north from Wartman Avenue with the project area to the left. The proposed development consists of two 100% residential buildings with a total of approximately 150,000 square feet of floor area and 206 income restricted dwelling units. Now I'll describe each of the buildings in more detail. 
Building AB is a seven-story building located on the southern portion of the project area. It will have approximately 100,000 square feet of floor area with the FAR 3.6 and will include 148 dwelling units. This is a view of Building AB from the corner of Lincoln Avenue and Wartman Avenue looking southwest. The building, the building will rise to 60 feet, six stories along the eastern and western portions of the building before setting back and rising to a maximum building height of 70 feet, seven stories. The building will step down to four stories on the northern side of the building, which you can see on the right side of the image where the red arrows will direct you. Here's the site plan. The main entrance of the building is located on Wartman Avenue, shown in blue. There is a 4,000 square foot outdoor rear yard recreation space, which contains landscaping, a playground shown in green, seating area shown in brown, and an adult exercise area shown in purple. The recreation area will be accessible from the building's first floor lobby as well as from the sidewalk entrances on Lincoln Avenue and Autumn Avenue. An additional outdoor recreation area is located above the sixth story on the roof at both corners of the building shown in yellow. Building amenities will include a laundry room, gym, and a community room on the ground floor and storage rooms, bike storage, and 37 parking spaces in a partial cellar. A new curb cut shown in red will facilitate access to the parking spaces. Additionally, the portion of Warman Avenue between Autumn Avenue and Lincoln Avenue will be built out with a roadbed and sidewalk that will open to the public and traffic connecting back to the street grid. This is a view of Building C along Lincoln Avenue frontage. Building C has approximately 47,000 square feet of resident residential floor area with the FAR at 2.2 and 58 dwelling units. Building C will rise to a height of approximately 39 feet four stories before setting back 15 feet and rising to a maximum building height of 48 feet, five stories. Here's a site plan. Building C has two entrances at the south and north corner of the building shown in blue. There is a 7,000 square foot outdoor rear yard recreation space which contains landscaping, a garden and playground shown in green, a seating area shown in brown, and an adult exercise area shown in purple. The rear yard will be accessible from the building's lobby as well as the building as, as well as from buildings A and B's rear yard. Building amenities will include a creation a recreation room, a bike storage, laundry room, community room, and 18 parking spaces on the ground floor. A new curb cut shown in red will provide access to the parking spaces. Five apartments on the fifth floor will allow access to 500 square feet of pri private terraces facing Lincoln Avenue. Along the frontage of Building C, Lincoln Avenue will be improved with a new sidewalk, which facilitates access to the building and improved pedestrian streetscape. Both buildings will incorporate design featuring, uh, incorporating design features to help mitigate flood risks, as mentioned earlier, given the location of the project area, which falls partially within the 0.2% annual chance floodplain as well as the 0.2% annual chance of projection. Both will set back from the lot lines in order to allow for additional landscaping along the front and sides. This landscaping will serve as a buffer for the ground floor residential units facing the street, in addition to serving as a rain guard that will capture the rain before it becomes polluted storm water runoff. The landscaping within the rear yard of building A, B, and the rear yard of building C will also serve as a rain guard. In addition, the ground floor of both buildings will be raised two feet. To facilitate the proposed development, the proposed actions are zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment, acquisition, and disposition. The applicant proposes a zoning map amendment to change an R4 district to an R6A district and an R6B district. The R6A district would include the southern portion of the project area along Warman Avenue, and the R6B district would include the northern portion of of the project area along Lincoln Avenue. A R6A zoning district permits a maximum FAR of 3.6 for residential use. Base heights are about 40 to 65 feet and a maximum building height of 80 feet, eight stories are permitted. Outside of the transit zone, parking is required for 50% of dwelling units, except that parking is only required for 25% of income restricted units. A R6 speed district 
permits a maximum FAR of 2.2, base heights are 30 to 40 feet, and a maximum building height of 50 feet, five stories are permitted. Outside of the transit zone, parking is 50% of dwelling units, except the parking is only required for 25% income restricted housing units. The zoning text amendment will amend Appendix S to designate the project as an MIH area with options one and two. The applicant proposes to map both options one and two. Option one requires that at least 25% of residential floor area must be permanently income restricted housing units and affordable to households with a weighted average of 60% of average medium income, also known as AMI. Option two requires that at least 30% of residential floor area must be uh, must be permanently income restricted units and affordable to households with a weighted average of 80% of AMI. HP HPD is proposing the acquisition and disposition of property. Here's a diagram showing the project's area's 10 tax lots. To orient you, north is the right at the north end of the project area and Warman Avenue is on the left at the south end of the project area. Lincoln Avenue is at the bottom of the image. Four of the 10 tax lots shown in green are subject to a 2007 deed, deed restriction that limits the construction to one to two family homes. The restriction was imposed as part of a UDAP that was approved in 2007 to construct one and two family homes at this location. The lots were disposed of, but the one and two family homes were never uh, developed, leaving these lots to remain vacant to this day. HPD is proposing the acquisition of these four lots, lots 20, 26, 29, and 38, to facilitate the proposed development that is subject to this application. HPD will acquire these tax lots and dispose of them to a developer with approval for a larger housing project that would be subject to the regulations of the proposed R6A and R6B zoning districts. As of June 1st, 2022, Certain property owners applying for, for land use changes must produce a racial, a racial equity report. This report will assist racial equity discussion during ULERP and will be publicly available in NYC's planning zoning application portal where land use applications are, all, are also publicly available. The applicant promotes the quality and affordability of the city's housing as well as strength and diversity of its many neighborhoods. The proposed development consists of two residential buildings with approximately 206 income restricted units. In 2015 and 2019, the estimated annual medium household income in East New York Star City was approximately $41,000, which is lower than the borough at approximately $60,000 and city approximately $64,000. This new housing would be, provide high quality apartments to some of the lowest, New York, uh, low, lowest income New Yorkers. Half of the units would be reserved for individuals and families earning under 50% AMI, and the other half for individuals or families earning up to 70% AMI. The proposed development will include a mix of studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units, serving individuals and families earning up to 70% AMI, as well as formerly homeless individuals and families. The proposed development is anticipated to comply with MI MIH option one. Based on, uh, based on option one, the estimated monthly rent average income for a household is shown. Here's a view of the demographic conditions in East New York Star City. As shown in figure one, the, pop the population was predominantly black, non-Hispanic, 43%, and Hispanic, 39%, shown in yellow and purple in the set of bars on the left. The percentage of black non-Hispanic residents in East New York is double the percentage for New York City, 20%. The share of Hispanic residents also exceeds the percentage for New York City, generally 28%, which you can see in the set of bars on the right. The percentage of white non-Hispanic population in East New York Star City is 3%, compared to 35% for Brooklyn and 31% for the entire city. As shown in figure two, between 2010 and 2020, the population of East New York Star City grew at a fa faster rate of 10% than Brooklyn, 9%, New, New York City, 8%, which is shown in the set of bars on the left of this graph. The growth of over 15,000 residents in the community was driven by a 10% increase in the Hispanic population, which is approximately 6,000 6, people, 
and 64 inc 64% increase in the Asian non-Hispanic population, which is approximately 5,000 people, mirroring borough and citywide trends. Aligned with citywide trends, East New York's large city experienced a decrease in the black non-Hispanic population 3% during the same period. Counter to citywide trends, the community's white non-Hispanic population declined by 4% between 2010 and 2020, compared to an 8% increase for Brooklyn and 0% citywide. In accordance with the City of New York's obligation to affirm affirmatively further uh, fair housing, the city prepared a fair housing plan in 2020, known as Where We Live NYC, that articulated six goals to advance fair housing in X, uh, NYC. The proposed project would advance the identified goals and strategies by redeveloping a vacant lot in East New York and facilitating 200% residential buildings with over 200 income restricted dwelling units. This housing would serve some of the most housing insecure households in the city and include amenities on site, such as a playgrounds and an adult exercise area with passive recreation spaces. The proposed development would add critical supply of deeply affordable, high quality housing, create housing for people with disabilities, redevelop a vacant lot with high quality housing and amenities, provide stable housing options for East New Yorkers who want to stay in the neighborhood, increase housing opportunities for New Yorkers with housing vouchers, and set aside units for New Yorkers currently in shelters. In summary, this is an application by the NYC Department of Housing Preservation and Development and JMB Realty LLC for a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, an acquisition, and a disposition to facilitate two residential buildings in East New York, Brooklyn, Community District 5, with a total of 206 income restricted housing units. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple to kick it off, and then I'm going to go to Commissioner Benjamin and then others. Um, so th the official actions here, and by the way, your first time, I mean, you're a natural. It's as if you've been here 100 times. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, acquisition and disposition. So you said four of the tax lots are subject to uh, a 2007 deed restriction, never developed. So here it is an effort by HPD to acquire back and then dispose the four plus the rest to a single developer for the purpose of doing this project. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, also, Wortman Avenue. It's Wortman Avenue, right? Not Wortman. Okay, Wortman Avenue mm -hmm. is mapped, but it currently has some activity on it. Is that correct? Correct. It's a, a local uh, garden group. And what what uh, what will happen with the local uh, garden group here? Are there efforts uh, uh, underway to uh, think about that? So currently, there is not a new home um, that has been confirmed for the group. Uh, we haven't really gotten any concrete feedback from HPD. I'm sorry, DOT. However, HPD will push the developer to assist in in uh, with the group um, to find a new home. Great. Last question for me. Uh, it's a proposal to change it from R4 to R6A in part and R6B in part. Um, can you say? Can you explain a little bit why not? Uh, why it was not proposed to do them both as R6A? Sure. So typically, at the end of blocks, uh, the short end of the block, you're able to have more density. So. Hence the reason why uh, building A, B is actually seven stories versus uh, building C, which is only uh, five stories. Uh, and because there's also a two-story um, USPS facility across the street from building A and B, there's less of a concern about light and noise uh, compared to building C, where it's five-story on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, you have residential one- and two-family homes across the street. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been joined, uh, I will note, by Commissioner Gold on Zoom. He's been there for a little while, but I just see him up there now. Uh, Commissioner Benjamin for questions. I just wanted to understand what happened with the prior approval and development and why it didn't go forward, if you know, or to ask that you have HPD respond to the question as to why the former development didn't go forward. Uh, good question. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. 
So uh, the uh, former developer who owned the lots actually went under, um, and is why the development didn't move forward, but also because of the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, so now um, J and, uh, JNB Realty LC is the owner looking to uh, obviously go through with this acquisition and disposition with HPD or with the city uh, to be able to build out uh, in, uh, this development. So does the private developer own the portions of the site that had been owned by the previous owner in the yes. 2007? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Commissioner. Okay. And they purchased them from that developer or the city foreclosed? Uh, from the developer. And in terms of the deed restriction, we are lifting the deed restriction as part of this, or is the city merely reacquiring it, and in doing so, it wipes title clean? Right. So this is more of a paper transaction. Um, the deed that was initially on these tax lots only allowed for so much density. Right. So, one to four family homes correct. because it was a UDAP. Correct. Not so, ULERP, UDAP. Correct. So uh, now we're, um, this, this acquisition and disposition is to lift this restriction uh, in order to move forward with the proposed development. So we are, in fact, as part as part of the acquisition, or is it as a result of the acquisition that the deed is cleared? It's yes, it's more of a like reacquire, redispose of the four tax lots. If that answers your question, we can get some more details on on the exact like mechanism. My, my recollection is that it's done as part of the the redisposition that we would dispose of this back to uh, the developer and 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 have a new deed restriction right. which would then have the affordable units and it would be this project that the right i'm just concerned or my concern in part is that the council is the entity that put the deed restriction on and, and the council will have to approve the new the new disposition right but it goes to my question as to whether they are actually able to do that as part of the project or whether as part of the acquisition title is cleared. That's always true. When the city acquires something, title is cleared from everything, including mortgages and Yeah. That that, that that's the case in here. Yeah. Okay. So we, yeah. so they're not actually voting on the deed restriction. They're just gonna vote to reacquire, which would have the effect. Y yes. It would have the same effect, and there will be a new restriction with this project that accompanies that as well. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm just, we'll take a, a deeper look at this and just confirm that that's how it works, but that's, that's, that's what it should be, and the council will vote on the acquisition, as, which would um, get rid of the restriction. But we'll take a, a deeper look just to make sure that's correct. Okay, and my second question is, when and why did HPD decide that one to four family housing wouldn't work? Is it because the developer wanted something different or because HPD, I mean, it seems like a lot of this area is in fact one and two family homes. So I'm kind of wondering why and when HPD decided that a multi-story building would be more appropriate. We're not sure, but we can have HPD address that at the CPC hearing. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Osorio. Commissioner Osorio. Commissioner Osorio. Thanks so much, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was very clear. Um, I especially appreciated the comments and the the depth of the analysis in terms of the vulnerability to flooding. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask you a similar or a related question. So given that the um, racial equity report notes that only 45% of the residents live within a quarter mile of a bus or a subway station, and that this is within a zone two evacuation zone from, OEM, from EM, I was wondering if you can discuss what is, what is the position of the department in terms of whether or not this has the required evacuation infrastructure to build this type of density within 
a vulnerable uh, area to flooding. Hi. Good, good afternoon, commissioners. This is Connie Chan. I think I appreciate the question. I think in this case, you know, I think as we all know, there are no requirements associated with Appendix G for kind of resiliency, evacuation, et cetera. Uh, however, we always urge applicants that are located in or near the 0.2% annual chance floodplain to take as many proactive measures as possible, which could include kind of components of the building as well as operational measures such as evacuation. And so I think that in terms of our stance, it's always to be as proactive as possible and to, to push the applicants to be proactive as possible about thinking about future conditions, even if the cur current regulatory status doesn't mandate certain things. But, you know, that's kind of our, our stance to that question. So just to understand, because it's not a requirement, we don't, that's where we, that's as far as we go in terms of the expectations and how much infrastructure there is for potential evacuation in an area like this? I think that we try to push folks, um, whether it's, you know, fellow city agencies, private property owners, to be as thoughtful as possible about future conditions and what will be required, even if the regulatory structure doesn't mandate stuff, you know, mandate specific things, like we do our best to try and, and push for proactive thinking on things like resiliency measures, evacuation measures, et cetera. Um, but we can have HPD speak a little bit more about their thinking specific to this development and its location in relation to the floodplain, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that this is one of those, and I, and I, I appreciate the response, but I understand and appreciate the response. I just think that this, this question may require, I mean, this is also a, not the only area where we will see this, but important potential residential development uh, that should be looked carefully, but at the same time, considerable vulnerability to, in this case, flooding. I, I also just wanted to, maybe along the lines of that question, um, suggest or encourage that we also think about heat in, in a similar way. Uh, I see that in your renderings. And I think you pointed that out. There's a considerable amount of vegetation planned for the sidewalk and so forth. I just wanted to note that it's it's a, a, it has a heat vulnerability index of four. And so, again, this is a really good, important opportunity to think about how the vegetation, the proposed vegetation, but also sort of like the street wall can also help mitigate some of that in the, along the sidewalk. And, and I just had a, another quick question. So you're, 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 maybe I missed it, but uh, what, what is sort of the plan as it stands right now in terms of local laws 92 and 94 regarding uh, green roofs and potential solar? I'm sorry, regarding green, can you say Local that? laws 92 and 94, what's the plan for to comply with that? Green roofs and oh, solar. Oh, and solar, yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a really great question. I don't know that we know, and we can certainly have HPD and the applicants speak to that. Um, one of the items, which I believe was covered in the presentation, but just to go back to your previous kind of comment, which is really well noted about not only flood resiliency, but kind of the heat vulnerability index. But um, I don't know if we can go back to the site plan. I just want to point out a couple of features, um, which we spoke to in the context of flood resiliency, but could also address heat vulnerability to a certain extent, which is the building is actually stepping back from the lot line along all of the frontages. So along Wartman, which we see along the left here, the building is uh, actually set back. They're not seen that quite yet. We'll get that up. Oh, okay. There we go. So along the, the southern frontage, the building is actually set back 10 feet to allow for that planted buffer, which again serves to give the residents at the ground floor some privacy, but also serves kind of capturing the stormwater runoff, as well as kind of adding more green planting, um, which can help towards the heat vulnerability index. But also both the eastern and western frontages of all of the buildings are also setting back five feet from those lot lines to allow for additional landscaping as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Cerullo will be followed by Commissioner Gold. I guess, um, except for, you know, I could think of so many examples um, on Staten Island, we don't get to see often uh, a development site that is com uh, sort of completely undeveloped and actually has natural features uh, still attached to it. What it makes me wonder, and maybe this is um, not something we know at this point, but whether or not, and, and it's hard to tell uh, what the sort of topography is here at all, but you know, given the the natural features that this property has, is there drainage runoff issues that it has served to provide in the neighborhood? And 
Do we know what sort of the infrastructure plans are both for the building and for the surrounding community? Will there need to be investment made beyond the development because of in the street and the surrounding neighborhood because what was once an area that may have accommodated rain and runoff and other sort of water-related impacts um, will now no longer exist? I think that's a great question, and we can certainly have the applicant speak to that in more detail, kind of generally, as well as with respect to the environmental review that was conducted. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Gold. Thank you. And um, I would just echo that I thought that was an excellent presentation, so thank you for uh, doing it. Um, you know, one question. Given um, the storied past of this property, um, and given you know, all of the mechanics of reacquiring, putting back and changing the zoning for you know, a, a, a new use. Um, can you speak a little bit about the wherewithal of the applicant, obviously not HPD, but G JMD, which you know, I'm not familiar with, but, and, and, and maybe more broadly, um, the work, what work goes into assessing the applicant, at least on HPD's side, their, their wherewithal, right? Because it sounds like the last go around on this property at least once and maybe twice, um, they didn't have the wherewithal to do it. So before we go through this, can, can we talk, um, or, or, you know, at some point, can we get them to, you know, give us a sense of the work that goes into making sure that the applicant can, can finish the product, uh, can finish the project? Sorry. Yeah, unfortunately, we we rather just have HPD address this at the CPC hearing. We yeah. wouldn't know at this time. Right, got it. Got it. Something certainly would be helpful to um, convey convey back on their side. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benjamin. And one more question, following up on Commissioner Cerullo, in terms of the street bed on Wortman and the improvements. Um, do we know one who's paying for it and what the actual street improvements will be? Are they putting in sewers? Are they putting in water lines? What is the plan for the workmen and who is paying for it and who is constructing it? Um, we can have the applicant speak on this in a little bit more detail, but our understanding is that the applicant will be required to build out the street bed and the sidewalk according to DOT standards and that we made part of kind of, you know, DOT's jurisdiction, if you will, um, and maintained as part of kind of city street grid. In terms of underground infrastructure, that's a really great uh, question. We don't know, but we'll certainly have the applicant speak to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Marine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So my question is, you know, being a, a developer of affordable housing in New York City, I know that the requirement usually is that you build out your sidewalk and half of the city street as part of the development process. Are we building out half of the street? Are we responsible? Is this, this applicant responsible for then building out the entire street and the sidewalk on the adjacent property? Can we get some more details on that? That would really be helpful. I know you probably can't answer the question right now. Yes, we can, we can confirm. It's our belief that they are building out the portion of the sidewalk along Lincoln Avenue that would front along building, both buildings A, B, and C and they would be building out the portion of Wartman Avenue between uh, Autumn and Lincoln, and but we'll certainly uh, confirm that and uh, have the, the applicant clarify that when they're back for the public hearing. So Great. appreciate Thank that. You yes, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, okay, with that, this item is certified. Thank you again. We'll look forward to seeing this item uh, down the line. Ryan, let's go to the next. Certainly. Uh, the second item on our agenda is the certification of a zoning map amendment in Queens Community District 2, and our presenter is Shristi Barachaya-Shakya to be, will be presenting. Sorry, Shristi. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Joe Gorodnik and commissioners. Um, this is a private application by PF Supreme LLC doing business as Planet Fitness for a zoning map amendment from C12 to C24 commercial overlay over the existing R71 and R6 zoning districts. This action would allow the Planet Fitness Gym to occupy approximately 16,000 square feet on a portion of the second floor of the existing building. No changes to the bulk of the existing building or project area are proposed. The project area is located at 6110 Queens Boulevard in Woodside neighborhood of Queens Community District 2. The project area shaded in blue with yellow dotted line on the map is located along the south side of Queens Boulevard, a major thoroughfare between 61st Street on the east 
and 59th Street on the west, and approximately three blocks west of the intersection were three major transportation corridors, Queens Boulevard, Brooklyn Queens Expressway, and the Long Island Railroad Traverse. The Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which is sunken below the grade of Queens Boulevard, traverses the neighborhood from northeast to the southwest. LIRR cuts through the neighborhood from northwest to southeast on an elevated structure. Immediately, <clears throat> immediately adjacent to the, to the development site on the same block are five of the seven big six 18-story residential towers built in a tower in a park configuration with planted open spaces and accessory parking areas. Uh, Calvary Cemetery is located just two blocks west of the project area that covers three, 365 acres of space. The nearest open space to the project area is the Big Bush Playground, located a block to the southeast and contains 2.5 acres of recreation space, including a soccer field, courts for handball and basketball, fitness equipment, and play equipment for children. Um, Dobo Plaza and Lawrence Virgilio Playground are located approximately three quarters of a mile to the north of the project area and include a playground, basketball courts, running track, and seasonal outdoor pool. The closest subway to the project area is 7 Train, Express and Local, that serves Flushing Main Street to 34th Street, Hudson Yard, and is accessible via 61st Street, Woodside Station, located approximately a quarter of a mile to the north of the project area, and station at 52nd Street, located approximately half a mile to the northwest of the project area. The LIRR is also accessible via the Woodside Station, located adjacent to the 7 train station on 61st Street. The development site is also served by bus services Q60, with numerous stops along Queens Boulevard, which runs along Queens Boulevard between Jamaica and Midtown Manhattan, and Q18, located approximately four blocks northwest northeast from the project area at the intersection of Queens Boulevard and 65th Place, which runs along 65th Place and Laurel Boulevard between Astoria and Maspeth. The neighborhood is characterized by a broad mix of land uses, residential densities, and street types influenced by the 200-foot-wide Queens Boulevard, a major corridor spanning the breadth of Queens and connecting Manhattan to Long Island. The surrounding area contains a mix of residential and commercial use, primarily consisting of multifamily residences, walk-up and elevator buildings, mixed commercial and residential buildings, commercial or office buildings, and parking facilities. Commercial uses colored in pink on the map and tall residential buildings ranging from 6 to 18 story colored in, colored in dark yellow on the map are predominantly located on Queens Boulevard with a broader neighborhood being characterized by a mix of row houses, two-family detached and semi-detached homes, multifamily worker buildings, and apartment buildings shaded in light yellow on the map. The development site here is outlined in red. <clears throat> the project area was originally mapped with an R6 district in 1961. In 1964, the eastern portion of the project area where the development site is located in was mapped with a C12 commercial overlay to facilitate the shopping center, which envisioned to primarily serve the residents of the Big Six Co-op development. In 1989, part of the project area fronting in Queens Boulevard was mapped with an R71 district. At this time, a C12 commercial overlay was also mapped at a depth of 150 feet from Queens Boulevard on the same block as R71. The project area is, is currently located in a R71 district with C12 commercial overlay and on 6th District with a C12 commercial overlay. We are now facing south, showing the development site and the adjacent Big Six residential complex. In the map here, the project area depicted by the dotted yellow line encompasses lot 100 of block 2314, consisting of the development site shaded in pink on the map, and a portion of lot 1 depicted by orange solid line on the, of the same block that contains five of the seven big six residential towers. The block of the development site is bounded by 200 feet wide Queens Boulevard to the north, 50 feet wide 61st Street to the east, 60 feet wide 59th Street to the west, and 60 feet wide 47th Street to the south. Lot 100 has approximately 402 feet of frontage in Queens Boulevard with a depth of approximately 174 feet and has an area of approximately 68,000 square feet. 
It is currently improved with a two-story, 65,000 square feet building, which is a part of Big Six Complex, and has a shopping center that includes a supermarket and various local convenient retail establishments, including shoe repair, cleaners, pizzeria, nail salon, delicatessen, and a pharmacy. It has 241 accessory parking spaces accessible via curb cuts provided from Queens Boulevard and 61st Street to the development site. The development site is located at the second floor of the existing two-story building and has historically been used for non-conforming gym use. Lot 1 has approximately 525 feet of frontage on Queens Boulevard and a lot area of approximately 286,000 square feet, of which 92,000 square feet lies within the project area. Lot 1 contains five of the big six towers, two of which lies within the project area, along with planted open space and accessory parking areas accessed by three tough cuts from the Queens Boulevard. The big six residential co-op development immediately adjacent to the development site was built in 1960s by a local union as part of the Mitchell Lama program that provided affordable rental and co-op housing for moderate and middle-income families. Big Six Towers is a naturally occurring retirement community with a lot of the residents aging in place. <clears throat> there are 988 units located within seven residential towers on 12 acres. The development site with the two-story existing building was originally built to provide commercial services to the residents of the Big Six Co-op development. Just to give a quick tour of the site, the image on the screen is showing the view of the development site facing south from 200 feet wide Queens Boulevard. The development is occupying the second floor space to the northwest corner of the building, seen on the right side of the screen here. It is a big, it is a part of the Big Six complex. We can see two of the Big Six towers looming just behind the development site. This image is showing the view of the development site facing southeast from Queens Boulevard. The image here is showing the view of the sidewalk along the south side of Queens Boulevard facing east. We can see the development side on the right side of the screen. And we can also see the curb cut from Queens Boulevard serving the driveway to accessory parking area of the building. This image is showing the view of the development side facing southwest from the intersection of Queens Boulevard and 61st Street. We can see the circular ramp structure at the corner that provides driveway exit access from the building's parking spaces at the rooftop to the shared parking space on the ground floor level fronting Queens Boulevard. This image is showing the view of the 61st Street facing south from Queens Boulevard. And this image is showing the view of the development site facing northeast from 61st Street. The curb cut provides driveway access to the loading area and shared parking space on the ground floor level of the building fronting Queens Boulevard. The applicant proposes a Planet Fitness Gym facility to encompass 16,000 square feet of the second floor of the, of the existing two-story building. No changes to the bulk of the existing building are proposed. This is a floor plan of the development site located on the second floor of the existing building the gym facility encompasses the west side of the building and can be accessed through three pedestrian entrances depicted, uh, depicted by pink stars on the map. The space on the eastern portion of the building is occupied by the Visiting Nurse Service Facility, which is a part of the Queens Boulevard Extended Care Facility located north of Queens Boulevard right across from the development site. The elevation here is showing just the northwest corner of the existing two-story building facing Queens Boulevard. The area shaded in pink here is showing the location of the proposed gym establishment on the second floor level. As mentioned in the illustrative drawing here, there will be no exterior alterations made to the building. The applicant is proposing a zoning map amendment from a C12 to a C24 commercial overlay over the existing R71 and R6 districts. It would facilitate the conformance of a 16,000 square feet non-conforming gym use at the development site. The existing R71 district allows for a maximum residential FAR of 4 with quality housing and community facility FAR of 4.8. The existing R6 district allows for a maximum residential FAR of 3 with quality housing and community facility FAR of 4.8. Both C12 and C24 commercial overlays within R71 and R6 districts 
have made commercial uses of up to 2.0 FAR. In existing C12 commercial overlay, only commercial uses, use groups five and six are permitted as of right, which consists primarily of local retail stores and personal service establishments, such as eating and drinking establishments, food stores, supermarkets, hardware stores, and more specific to this application, health and fitness establishments limited to 10,000 square feet of floor area per establishment. The parking requirements for C12 commercial overlay is one space per 300 square feet of floor area. The zoning map amendment from C12 to C24 commercial overlay would allow for additional wider range of commercial uses, including home maintenance, repair services, funeral establishments, theaters, etc., and more specific to this application, health and fitness establishments without any limitation to floor area to locate in the project area. The rezoning would also change the parking requirements to one space per 1,000 square feet of the floor area. The health and fitness citywide tax amendment was enacted by the city council on December 9, 2021, allowing the health and fitness establishments without any limitation as to floor area as of right in a C2 district within use group nine, eliminating the need for a special permit from the board of standards and appeals that had previously been required. To summarize, PF Supreme LLC doing business as Planet Fitness Gym is seeking a zoning map amendment from C12 to C24 commercial overlay over the existing R71 and R6 districts to facilitate the use of a 16,000 square feet gym establishment to be located on the second floor of the two-story existing building. As a reminder, no changes to the bulk of the existing building or project area are proposed. And this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to do a quick summary and make sure that I've got it. So it's an existing structure with no change to the bulk or the outline of the structure, correct? Correct. The first floor will remain the same, which is an existing supermarket, shoe repair, cleaners, et cetera. Yes? Yeah. This would apply to the second floor only, which is proposed to be a fitness center. Correct. Uh, today, under the C12, fitness center will be capped at 10,000 square feet, correct? Correct. Under the future C24, there would be no limit to the size, and they are proposing a 16,000 square foot facility. Is that correct. right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Benjamin. Do you know what the hours of operation would be, or is there any concern about that? Um, at the moment, I cannot. Uh, typically, Planet Fitnesses are 24 hours. I think they advertise that. And I don't think we would have concerns about that since this is a a vibrant, dense neighborhood near transit where people are coming and going at all hours and, in fact, probably would help with uh, safety um, nearby. And it doesn't share a building. It's not in, the, in a residential building. That, that typically, the issue was always that you had residences above it and then you're operating 24-7. You've got bikes. That, that was the issue. The having it in a standalone right, building. Right, and the noise, sort of, of the barbells and other equipment. That's right. It's just... Yeah, it's not as, as uh, obtrusive in this standalone building like this. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this item is now certified. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, Ryan, item three. The third item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map amendment in Queens Community District 1, and Sarah Avila will be presenting. Thank you. I will note Commissioner Rampershad is recused on this item. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Garadnik and Commissioners. This is a private application by 2650 BQE LOR LLC for a zoning map amendment to facilitate a new 86,406 square foot three-story building with 77,436 square feet of light industrial and warehouse space and 8,970 square feet of accessory office space at 2650 Brooklyn Queens Expressway, Queens Community District 1. The proposed action is a zoning map amendment to change a M11 zoning district to an M12 zoning district. The project is on the border of the Astoria and Woodside neighborhoods in western Queens. It is on the eastern end of Astoria and the northern end of Woodside. The project area is comprised of block 1019 lots 1 and 2. The project area is generally bounded by Beluva Avenue to the north, Borough Place to the west, 27th Avenue to the south, and the Brooklyn Queens Expressway to the east. The project rezoning area is 50,981 square feet. 
One block to the west is the railroad right-of-way, which can be seen running parallel to Borough Place. Across the BQE West is the Amazon DBK1 Fulfillment Center at the former Beluva Warehouse, as well as a U-Haul facility and the NYC TLC inspection site. Two blocks east of the project area is St. Michael Cemetery, which is bounded by the BQE and the Grand Central Parkway. To the southeast of the project area is St. Michael's Playground. The surrounding area is served by the Q18 bus, which runs along 30th Avenue, which is west of the project area. The 46th Street E, M, and R subway station is located approximately 0.6 miles southwest of the project area. The rezoning area and surrounding area are in an existing M11 zoning district that generally runs north and south along the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Also within the 600 foot radius are two separate residential zoning districts. To the east of the project area is an R4 zoning district that allows for detached, semi-detached, and detached single and two family buildings. To the west is a widely mapped R5 zoning district with an assortment of housing types that allows for single or two family homes along with multifamily buildings. Okay, uh, next we'll walk through some site photos of the project area and the surrounding area to show the existing conditions. This photo shows block 1019, lot two of the project area, which is the proposed development site. This is a view of the site facing northeast from Borough Place. Lot 2, 2650 Borough Place is improved with a one-story building with a mezzanine. It is a 35-foot tall mixed commercial and light industrial building that was constructed in 1964 and is approximately 38,000 square feet. Currently, there are 48 unenclosed parking spaces on the site. This photo shows the development site and its relationship to the BQE West. We are now looking at the development site, Lot 2, in the Access Corridor Street, which is adjacent to the BQE uh, West. This photo is looking southwest and has a project area on the right side of the photo. This photo is looking northwest from Borough Place and has a project area on the right side of the photo. Both lots one and two um, can be seen on the right side of the photo. Lot 1, 2660 Borough Place is improved with an auto body collision building containing 4,080 square feet and was built in 1966. Next, I'll note on this slide, the site plan is rotated to the right to give a better view. So now we have Borough Place at the top of the slide and the BQE West on the bottom of the slide. The proposed development site, Lot 2, would be developed with a new three-story mixed-use light industrial building. The development would contain approximately 86,406 square feet of floor area, including approximately 77,436 square feet of light industrial and warehouse space, and 8,970 square feet of accessory office space. At the moment, the applicants have not confirmed any prospective tenants for the proposed development. The proposed building would have an FAR of 2.0, which is the max under the proposed M12 zoning district. A total of 107 off-street accessory parking spaces would be provided at the seller level. It would be accessed from a new 20-foot curb cut on Borough Place on the west side of the project area, uh, which is at the top of the slide. Three additional new curb cuts, each 30 feet, would facilitate the movement of goods in and out of the ground floor light industrial and warehouse space. It would be located along the southern edge of Lot 2 on Borough Place and BQE West. This is a uh, schematic the applicants have provided. They are proposing uh, the parking to be located in the cellar, shaded in gray. On the first and second floors would be the light industrial and warehouse spaces, uh, shaded in yellow. On the third floor, they are proposing to have the accessory office space, shaded in purple. The proposed action is a zoning map amendment to change a M11 zoning district to M12 zoning district on block 1019 lots one and two. M11 zoning districts allow for a max of 1.0 FAR, the max FAR under M12 zoning districts is 2.0 FAR. The use groups, parking regulations, and signage requirements are the same for both zoning districts. There is no difference in those. To summarize, this is a private application by 2650 BQE LOR LLC for a zoning map amendment to facilitate a new three-story, 86,400 square foot um, square foot building uh, with 77,436 square feet of light industrial and warehouse space and 8,970 square feet of accessory office space at 2650 Brooklyn Queens Expressway uh, West, Queens Community District 1. The applicants are proposing a zoning map amendment to change a M11 zoning district to M12 zoning district. Thank you so much, and I will now take any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see if there are questions, Commissioner Dweck. Just, just uh, my education. Uh, an M12 or an M11 allows for warehousing? Uh, what? No, no. Yes, it allows for warehouse uses. 
So in theory, you know, any 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 of these locations could be turned into a distribution center or that that is they're permitted by zoning. Yes, uh, my understanding though, Sarah, is that the applicant doesn't have designs on any. No, no, I know that this applicant in this in this specific case doesn't. But again, you know, once we or once the commission approves, and, and then then it's really yeah as a, as a right use. I, I would also I think we might want to note the uh, sort of relative isolation from say sensitive uses, and I think pretty good access to the expressway. So you know, the commission can weigh whether or not even if this is a location where that kind of use would probably be okay. I think there's one already there, right? Uh, yeah, there's there's one across actually the BQE, but also I would note that the M11 would allow for this as well, and the M12 just allows for more FAR and a second story, so right. um, that should also be considered. No, th thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Crowell, did you have a question? It was answered um, through that question there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Osorio, and I will note that after this item, we're going to take a quick five-minute break. We have a quorum in the room. We need to keep our quorum in the room. We're going to take a quick five-minute break. We will come back after this item, and we, I think the, the final three will, will move uh, actually a little faster than the rest of the day. So go ahead, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the question, Commissioner Dweck. It's actually a follow-up to that question. So in this case, the applicant has not expressed the interest in using the additional FAR as a last-mile delivery facility, or, or, or has that been discussed, or if you can expand a little bit on that? Uh, yes. Uh, we did ask the applicants um, to specify a specific work program or if any prospective tenants. Um, they have not clarified that at the moment, uh, but um, they're intending it to be a warehouse and uh, maker space. But um, when it comes back for a future public hearing, um, we will ask that they provide more details. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate the question. I think that this is, this is an issue that we're going to start seeing, or that we're already seeing across the city. And because a lot of these users are a lot of right, I think deserve, they deserve sort of like a larger discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, all right, with that, this item is certified, and we will see it back soon. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and we are going to take a quick five-minute break, and we will be back here at 321 to finish the agenda for the day. We're back. We can We're back. back. We've we got a forum. Uh, thank yeah. you all for taking a five-minute break. Uh, let us move on to the next item on our agenda. Ryan, let's yes. hear what it is. We have the fourth item on our agenda. It's a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 12. And Lucia Capuccia is our presenter. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Garodnik and Commissioners. So this is a pre-hearing follow-up for a private application from Plaza Realty, LLC, for a zoning map amendment from a C8-2 district to a C4-5A district within the Special Ocean Parkway district and a zoning text amendment to Appendix F to facilitate the development of a new attached two-building mixed-use development, including over 176,000 square feet of residential space or 231 units, 60 of which will be permanently income-restricted and over 36,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. Uh, this application was certified on September 6th, and the public hearing is scheduled for this Wednesday, December 14th. This project is located at 1880-1888 Coney Island Avenue between Avenues O and P in Community District 12 in Brooklyn. So this is an aerial view looking north toward Prospect Park in Manhattan. The project is on the border of Midwood. It's a neighborhood in the center of so southern Brooklyn, bounded by Kensington and Flatbush to the north, Flatbush and Marine Park to the east, Homecrest and Sheepshead Bay to the south, and Borough Park to the west. The project area contains 15 lots fronting on Coney Island Avenue. Coney Island Avenue is a major north-south mixed-use and commercial corridor that runs roughly five miles from Prospect Park to Coney Island. It's a 100-foot wide street with a variety of uses, including residential apartment buildings, mixed-use residential and commercial buildings, and retail stores, ranging from auto repair shops to big box stores. 
Um, this is a similar view showing the project area within the context of the surrounding area. To the west of the development is a special ocean parkway district. To the east of the area are the elevated Q and B subway lines. The Kings Highway subway stop is approximately half a mile away from the development site. The area is also served by multiple bus lines. The B9 runs along Avenue N to the north, connecting Bay Ridge to Marine Park. The B68 bus runs directly along Coney Island Avenue, connecting Prospect Park to Coney Island. And the B82 bus runs along Kings Highway to the south, connecting Bensonhurst to Spring Creek. This, um, here, this is a land use map, and here we can see Coney Island Avenue is in the center. And as I mentioned, it's a major north-south mixed-use um, commercial corridor. The project area is outlined in light blue, and the development site is outlined in light yellow along the mid-block. The light yellow lots on the map are all the residential uses in the surrounding area off of Coney Island Avenue, and they range from single-family detached homes to medium-density apartment buildings. Purple lots are industrial uses. Um, in this area, they are primarily auto-oriented shops and building supply stores. There's also a strong presence of commercial uses seen here in red, including the development site. Um, in this area, these include office and home supply stores, insurance and law offices, and convenience stores, many of which have residential units located above. The project area is mapped within a C82 zoning district. The C82 district is a commercial district that allows automotive and other heavy commercial uses along with com community facilities. The C82 district permits these commercial uses at a maximum FAR of 2, but some community facilities allow a maximum FAR of 4.8. It does not permit residential uses. The surrounding area is also zoned with low-density residential district, districts, including R41, R5, and R5B. Um, R41 is a contextual residential district for one- and two-family homes with a maximum FAR of 0.75. The R5 district is a low-density general residence district that permits residential buildings up to 1.25 FAR and community facility buildings up to 2 FAR. The R5B is a contextual residential district primarily consisting of three-story row houses with a maximum FAR of 1.35. Directly across the street on Colony Island Avenue from the development site to the east is an R7A district with some C23 commercial overlays. These buildings were rezoned as part of the 2006 Midwood rezoning. In the Midwood rezoning CPC report, the commission noted that the R7A C23 district was appropriate due to the Coney Island Avenue being a wide street and a major corridor with bus lanes and nearby subways. R7A districts allow for buildings up to 4.6 FAR with inclusionary housing and generally yield seven to eight story buildings. Um, it should be noted the R7A mapped here is not mapped with mandatory inclusionary housing. The project area is also within the Special Ocean Parkway District, which was approved in 1977 and includes blocks east and west of Ocean Parkway. The Special OP District was established to preserve the character of one and two family homes along Ocean Parkway itself and to limit the proliferation and bulk of community facilities in the area. In 1993, the Special Ocean Parkway Subdistrict was established. The subdistrict encourages large single and two-family homes and limits um, permitted FAR to 1.5. The development site is within the most eastern block of the Ocean Parkway District, and portions of two irregularly shaped lots within the development site are in the subdistrict. The portions of the two lots within the subdistrict, um, shown here with the arrow, um, uh, excuse me, will not be developed and will remain as landscaped open space. Therefore, this project is not impacted by the bulk or FAR limitations for the subdistrict. So this view takes a Western aerial view to show a complete picture of the project area and development site. The development site consists of seven lots, two of which are those irregularly shaped lots, and will only be partially developed, with the undeveloped portion remaining as the landscaped open space behind the development site. As seen here, four lots in the development area are currently improved with the Staples office supply store. The lot next to the Staples is improved with a parking lot for the Staples. The remaining two lots to the left previously were improved with a two-story commercial building, shown here is the white building. This two-story building was demolished in July of this year, and the lots are now vacant. The applicant has received a self-certification from the Department of Buildings and plans to use these two lots as a parking lot 
as an interim use while this application moves through the land use review process. Um, this view looks uh, west directly at the development site on Coney Island Avenue. You can see the two lots that were formerly improved with the commercial building are now vacant. The proposed actions um, for this project would facilitate the development of an eight-story mixed-use commercial and residential building, totaling approximately 216,000 square feet. The proposed development would include 179,967 square feet of residential space. Residential units would occupy floors two through eight. The residential portion would include approximately 231 dwelling units, approximately um, 60 of which would be permanently income restricted to households with an income at or below 60% of the area median income or AMI pursuant to MIH option one. Development would also have 36,000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor. Parking would be provided on two cellar floors. The applicant is currently proposing 242 accessory parking spaces, although only 86 are required by the zoning district. The proposed actions um, include a zoning map amendment to change the existing C2 district along Coney Island Avenue to a C45A within the Special Ocean Parkway District. The proposed C45A district would alter the permitted uses under the current C82 zoning to include a wider range of commercial and retail uses, as well as to allow residential uses. The proposed C45A would increase the maximum permitted FAR for commercial uses from two to four. In the C45A district, four FAR is permitted for community facility uses and residential regulations are subject to the R7A equivalent. The R7A zoning is a contextual district where quality housing regulations are mandatory. R7A districts allow for buildings up to 4.6 FAR when providing inclusionary housing, and they typically result in buildings around eight or nine stories that come up to the street with a setback um, from the street between four or seven stories. The applicant also proposes a zoning text amendment to Appendix F to map MIH coterminous with the um, C45A district creating permanently um, income-restricted housing via MIH options one and two. At this time, the applicant is proposing to comply with MIH option one, that would make 60 um, units permanently income-restricted and an average of 60% AMI. On October 24th, Community Board 12 held a public hearing and with a vote of four in favor, 24 against, and um, one abstaining voted to disapprove the application without conditions. Concerns from the community board included building height and density, the bedroom mix, and traffic concerns. On November 21st, the Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing for this application. Subsequently, the BP recommended to approve this application with conditions. Um, those conditions are the following. To redesign the massing along Coney Island Avenue to articulate two separate buildings, reduce a more family-oriented unit mix with a percentage of three-bedroom apartments, to retain a qualified nonprofit administering agency for the 1880-1888 Coney Island Avenue MIH lottery, to incorporate sustainability measures such as blue roofs, passive house design, and or on-site energy generation, to coordinate with the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and Department of Transportation, to install rain gardens along Coney Island Avenue as part of a Builder's Pavement Program, or BPP, in consultation with CB12 and the local council member, to retain Brooklyn-based contractors and suppliers and to provide employment opportunities to area residents, and to work with um, the Department of Transportation, CB12, and the local council member to develop and implement a traffic management plan. I would also like to note for the commission that the applicant is currently working on responding to the BP concerns about the massing. Uh, in summary, this is a private application for a zoning map amendment from C82 to a C45A within the Special Ocean Parkway District and a zoning text amendment to Appendix F to facilitate the development of a new eight-story um, mixed-use building, including 179,000 square feet of residential space or 230 units with 60 permanently income-restricted units and 36,000 square feet of commercial space. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. And I will note this is coming to a public hearing, as are the next two items on Wednesday. So you may have questions for the Department of City Planning. You may have questions for the applicants. But 
you know, just remember that uh, the applicant will be present here on Wednesday. Commissioner Dweck. Just for some clarification, the C-458 um, allows for an FAR-4 for commercial use, but a 4.6, mandates a 4.6 under residential use with the R-7A equivalent. Yes. Okay. So as noted, I think uh, when we brought this up for certification, I think one of my comments and concerns was that uh, the R-7A across the street is not really the same as the R-7A that's being proposed because it's a um, uh, an MIH, which would give it an additional, I believe, 10 feet in height, which would, in my belief, be out of context for the neighborhood that uh, we're proposed in. Another observation that I have is I believe that there's a successful building on the corner of Avenue P and Coney Island Avenue going south, which is a commercial office building. And under the C45A designation, that would allow for this building to be completely commercial with no guaranteed um, housing units being built whatsoever. Am I, am I co correct on that? Yeah, I am. Uh, yes. Okay. I'm just showing off that I know something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> so, again, that, that's a concern that I have. And, uh, you know, obviously I uh, I'm in, read the uh, community board's uh, uh, recommendation, and, and I understand the concern. Do we have any indication what the council member is thinking? Do, have we gotten any indication on that? Because I think that's going to play an important part in where this project goes. Uh, yeah, the applicant has been in touch with the council member. Um, they can speak more to that? Uh, yeah, I will, I'll have the applicant speak more to that. Um, they have been in touch, and the council member is aware of this. And my final, and, and the reason I, I came up with, the, you know, in my mind, the scenario where it just gets developed as an office building, which I think uh, would be uh, the height in the context would be too large for this, is because with the, with the uh, absence of, in the absence of 421A, I don't know how this commercial, how this property becomes commercially feasible as a development site for a residential. And um, again, that's not in our hands. So my, my true concern here is that the bulk is approved, the, 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 the rezoning goes through, but it gets built as a, as a massive commercial building um, in, in this neighborhood, which doesn't give us the housing that we so badly need. And that is one of the um, underlying reasons why, why I would approve, why I would, I would vote yes for you know, to create housing. But for more office space, I think that it might be a little bit out of context. So that's my, my major concern, and I'm hoping that the uh, developer can address that on Wednesday. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Oh, yes, go can, ahead, Lucia. I was going to say, I can certainly have them speak to that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Knuckles, and then Commissioner Osorio. Uh, thank you. And while I would agree with my colleague that, that uh, housing is needed and this is a good opportunity, um, I just want to – and I'm glad uh, – that you've indicated that the developer is listening to the borough president because I think his concern about the massing is, is well placed. Uh, that's a, a, a very wide site, and as proposed, it, it, it really has a kind of deadening effect uh, on 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 that uh, on that avenue because it is so large. And I know it's a challenge, but I would I would hope that. Um, uh, the applicant's architects would, would be creative and come up with something uh, with um, a little more character and diversity uh, uh, to the facade of the site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I was um, just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I'm hoping that we can see more during, during the public hearing. Uh, one is, um, if possible, it would be great to understand a little bit how the uh, AMIs by race breakdown is responding to the proposed um, affordability thresholds. That will be interesting. I'm also interested in understanding, and, and, and also the because the renderings are so look so flat and so gray on top, I'm interested in understanding, you know, what is the proposal there to comply with 92 and 94 in terms of green rooftops and, and uh a solar, but also in the light of the, the recommendations from the borough president, you know, because of the size of these roofs, uh, they lend themselves to something really, it could be an opportunity, right, in terms of potential agriculture or other types of uses in which we can activate those those big flat roofs. Um, so interested in hearing what the proposal is, I, yeah. I, unless I missed it, the renderings don't show much on that end. But then the other question that I, want, I had, which I'm really hoping maybe you know but hopefully we'll learn more on, on, on during the public hearing, is 
why so much on required parking? Like so much. <laughs> yeah, um, I can speak to both of those things. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the green infrastructure, um, they are planning to have um, a green roof and also solar panels on at least 20% of the roof. Um, there's also plans to have um, 9,500 square feet of open recreational space that will be active. Um, so those are um, in the plans and the applicants speak more to that. Um, and then in terms of the parking, I'll have the applicant speak to this. Um, it did come from community board 12 um, concerns and input. And how has been the general response from the applicant to the community board's concerns? Um, I'll have the applicant speak to that. Um, they obviously have been working with the community board and the council member Thank throughout, throughout the process. Thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, with that, this item will be back with us before long, 48 hours. We will <laughs> talk again about 1880, 1888 Coney Island Avenue. Uh, thank you, Lucia. Uh, let's move up on okay. to item number fifth, uh, number five, yeah. Ryan. Yeah, so this, this item is a uh, pre-hearing review of a letter of intent to acquire office space in Manhattan Community District 2, and our presenter is Ariel B. Ariel. Hello, Ariel. Hi, Chair Garadnik. Um, sorry, how do I get the PowerPoint? Oh, we're <laughs> okay. getting it up for you. And then, okay, yeah, thank you so you much. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this is an application by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, and Manhattan Committee Board 2, CB2, for office space acquisition at 3 Washington Square Village in Manhattan Community District 2. CB2 reviews land use and zoning matters, municipal service delivery, and other issues in Community District 2, and has had its office at the location since 1990. CB2 is currently using the space under a license agreement. The site is in the C17 commercial district and is centrally located in Greenwich Village. The surrounding area has a mix of residential, commercial, and university uses. The area to the west of the site is characterized by low to mid-rise residential buildings with ground floor commercial use, and the areas to the north, south, and east of the site are characterized by mid to high-rise university, residential, and commercial buildings. The site is well served by public transit. There are numerous subway stations within half a mile from the site. The CB2 office is located at the Washington Square Village apartment complex, which is a part of the New York University campus directly south of Washington Square Park. The apartment complex is a super block bounded by West Third Street to the north, Bleecker Street to the south, Mercer Street to the east, and LaGuardia Place to the west. The CB2 office is on the ground floor of a 17-story mixed-use building on the north side of Bleecker Street, and the building entrance is located next to Wooster Street. The CB2 office is connected to an ADA-accessible hallway, and there is no parking allocated to CB2 staff. This is a view from the building entrance at Bleecker Street looking west. This is another view from the building entrance at Bleecker Street, looking south onto Wooster Street and the Silver Towers. CB2 and DCAS proposed the acquisition of 1,320 square feet of office space for CB2's continued use. The space has offices, workstations, a staff pantry, a small waiting area, and a conference room. The offices and workstations accommodate four staff members, and the conference room accommodates up to 20 people for hybrid public meetings. In conclusion, the proposed acquisition of office space would allow CB2 to continue performing its duties at 3 Washington Square Village. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions on this one? Unbelievable. Congratulations, Ariel. Thank you very much. The first, thank you so much. first in history. <laughs> you did it. Uh, thank you very much. We will have a public hearing on this item uh, on Wednesday, and let's go on to our final item of the day, Ryan. Thank sure. The sixth item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of an acquisition uh, in the Bronx Community District 12, and our presenter is Manny Lagares. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This application is coming back for pre-hearing review. The applicants, the New York City Department of Transportation, Department of Design and Construction, and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services are requesting acquisition of portions of two privately owned lots 
to be used as permanent easement to facilitate the reconstruction of a retaining wall and roadway. In 2014, FDNY identified the damaged condition of Pratt Avenue and the retaining wall. In 2017, temporary remedial measures were incorporated to minimize future slippage and cracking. The repairs were facilitated by a temporary easement on Lot 101, allowing access to the area and to perform emergency work to support the retaining wall. Lot 17, which is the unimproved portion of Pratt Avenue, was also used to provide access to the retaining wall. The requested action supports a capital budget program. The project area is outlined in yellow in the proposed permanent easements to be acquired are shown in red. The 36-acre Cedar Falls Park is located immediately north of the project area. 30 acres of this park are wetlands and woodlands and six acres are for active recreational use. The area within an R4 zoning district, the area is within an R4 zoning district and is predominantly residential with two family detached and semi-detached homes. The white portion labeled Pratt Avenue is the area of the street that is held up by the retaining wall and is to be reconstructed. The tax lots shown immediately north of the dead end are as much as 15 feet below the grade of the built street. Within this area, lot 17, which fronts on Marola Place, is a mapped but unimproved section of Pratt Avenue that is under DCAS jurisdiction. Portions of, portions of lots 12 and 15, which also front onto Marola Place, are privately owned, and the proposed area of acquisition is in the rear of lots 12 and 15. The acquisition will facilitate the construction, maintenance, and inspection of the full length of the retaining wall. This photo from Marola Place shows the unimproved area of Pratt Avenue with the temporary structure supporting the retaining wall and the built portion of Pratt Avenue. To the right of the photo is part of Lot 15. Lots 12 and 15 are below the grade of the built portion of Pratt Avenue. The photo key map on the right shows the approximate location of the area of lots 12 and 15, shaded in yellow, with the rear portion of those lots shown as the area of proposed acquisition. Uh, this photo of Pratt Avenue looking south towards Needham Avenue. Wait, wait, some, uh, this is the wrong slide for me. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a photo of Pratt Avenue looking north towards the dead end and showing the deteriorating retaining wall and roadway. You can see the drop-off in gray on the outside of the retaining wall. This is a photo of Pratt Avenue looking south towards uh, Needham Avenue. As you can see, it's in very poor condition. This slide shows some of the damage to the retaining wall with the temporary support holding it together. The illustrative site plan shows the full extent of the proposed project with the area that is shaded in green indicating the area needed for the retaining wall's construction access and long-term maintenance and inspection area. As it curves over to the left, it includes the rear portions of lots 12 and 15 that are needed to ensure full access to the reconstructed retaining wall. In addition to the reconstruction of the retaining wall, there is enough room in the map right of way to slightly widen the roadway and provide for sidewalk reconstruction, as well as combined sewer infrastructure. Uh, Community Board number 12 voted unanimously in favor of the application. Vote of 30 in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions. And the Bronx Borough President also approved the application. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Manny. So we've got uh, DOT, DDC, and DCAS coming on Wednesday. Who's coming? Uh, yes. All of them? Yes. The, uh, team presentation, yes. Okay. And uh, the easement for this emergency work, mm -hmm. it expires in 2024. Is that right, uh, well, the existing easement? Well, uh, well, there's a temporary easement. Yes, it expires in 2024. Okay. And there's and this... Uh, this proposal is to get a, an, a to acquire a a new easement, not a temporary uh, easement, maybe a permanent correct. easement. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, has there been any f conversation yet with the affected homeowners in the area? Uh, well, the applicant has reached out. They sent an uh, an affidavit uh, uh, for a response. They they want to notify them of the actions that are before 
uh, the commission on this item, and uh, and, and also to mail back uh, the forms uh, of the affidavit. Okay, great. And we can talk to them about that further on okay. Wednesday. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles. So, Manny, uh, the property owners have been notified, right? That's what uh, you yes. were referring to. That's correct. And uh, you have not heard back from them? Uh, no. Right. Uh, can we assume that notification is, uh, as opposed to the assent of the property owners, is, is satisfies the, uh, the uh, applicable law in this case? Well, as long as they've been notified is what that I'm saying. Is, that is correct, yes. They, yeah, they said, that's our there's always a yeah. possibility that maybe one of the homeowners or both cannot be reached. Right. Here. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Other questions? Okay. Seeing none, this item uh, will be back with us on Wednesday. Thank you, Manny, as always. Okay. Uh, Ryan, do we have any other items or any business for today? We do have um, future votes, um, so uh, we'll cover those quickly. Uh, for future votes, uh, staff have prepared reports for consideration on Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. Um, first up, we have the Bruckner Sites uh, city map uh, change. And uh, the department is recommending approval. I'm just going to cover this one uh, for this city map amendment. Uh, it would facilitate the development of 114 units of housing. 34 would be permanently income restricted pursuant to MIH. The street proposed to be eliminated has not been built out and is not an essential part of the street network. While the site is in a lower density neighborhood, uh, the site fronts on Bruckner Boulevard and is a, it is an approximately an hour and 15 minutes by express bus to the building that we sit in now. It is a 42-minute bus ride to the jobs and retail at Fordham Plaza and a 26-minute bus ride or 10-minute bike ride to the job center around Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, staff reiterates its support for the rezoning approved by the commission and city council on the site and fully supports this companion city map amendment. Um, moving on, we have uh, 446, 448 Park Avenue rezoning. I believe Jesse Hirakawa is on Zoom to discuss this. Jesse? Hello, Ryan. Yes, I'm here. Um, am I being heard? Yes, we can hear you. Amazing. So the, the Department of City Planning staff supports the applicant's proposal to amend the zoning map and text amendment to facilitate the construction of a new six-story residential building with 11 units, three of which will be income restricted. But we believe the proposal will facilitate new mixed income housing in a walkable transit accessible area while complementing the mixed use character of Park Avenue and bring adjacent pre-existing residential uses into conformance with zoning. Based on the primarily residential character of the uses within the project area, the department supports extending this special mixed use district from the east and pairing R6A with M14, which we believe is more suitable than the M12 which has a higher parking requirement uh, designed for larger um, larger size lots and areas further uh, from public transit. Um, and that completes my statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesse. We have a question from Commissioner Osorio. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Jesse. And and uh, uh, kudos on the report. It's very clear, very concise. I just had a quick question. I, I, I appreciate how much uh, you mentioned there the, the recommendation to have the citywide area story. Uh, study. I was wondering if 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 it's possible to recommend as well, maybe a time frame for when that study could or should be carried on. Carried out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We we will we'll, we will discuss that that point uh, yeah. and when instead of putting Jesse uh, uh, on the spot to answer a question, which I think we will probably need to visit uh, together, uh, we will come back to you. Okay. Yep. Uh, other questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. Ryan? Yeah, thank we you. also have Reform Temple of Forest Hills rezoning. Uh, Hai Kang Yang is here in the Zoom to discuss the department's recommendation. Hai Kang? Hi, everyone. The Department of City Planning staff supports the applicant's proposal to amend the zoning map from an R12A to an R7D zoning district to facilitate the development 
development of a new mixed-use building that would enable the reformed Temple of Forest Hills to remain at its current location and continue to serve the community with a new facility that would include flexible community spaces, as well as provide a mix of new market and income-restricted housing, which is much needed in Queens. The rezoning would facilitate a development that is consistent with nearby existing density and bulk and is appropriate due to its proximity to transit and its job hubs. A CPC report reflecting this recommendation has been prepared for the commission. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And uh, we, have a, we have one post hearing follow up. Uh, it's uh, 213 227 West 28th Street parking special permit. I will say that staff is preparing a comprehensive response to the questions. Uh, raised at the public hearing, and there was a response from the applicant in your package. Um, if there's any further questions on that and or anything else, let us know, and we'll be back on uh, January 3rd to really to really dig into this one. Great, thank you, Ryan. Uh, yes, the letter was primarily related to the the width of the initial garage entrance, which apparently was. 16 rather than 17 feet. But anyway, we will get in, into this one in great depth uh, in early January. So, okay. Thank you, Ryan. Anything else? No, that is it for our agenda. With today. that, let me thank uh, everybody uh, for your patience today. It was a long one. And to the staff of the department, as always, we appreciate all of your diligence and attention to these matters. Uh, and we will see you all in a couple of days. Thank you. Thank you.